Greetings and welcome. This happens to be the 18th webinar under the aegis of the International Chamber of Commerce Sri Lanka or ICC Sri Lanka. And on this occasion, they are joined in the organizing of this event by Kariami as well as the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Sri Lanka. And we do have the support of some sponsors, Cornucopia, Job Enrich Private Limited, then to PIPT, Senid, and Learn TV. We're grateful for that kind of support. Now, I would like to mention for the sake of all that this webinar is to be accessed on the Facebook pages of ICC Sri Lanka, that of Korea Me, then Daily FT, the Institute of Chartered Accountants, CA Sri Lanka, as well as SEMA. So those are the Facebook pages across which, or those platforms will allow anyone access to this webinar. Now you have just likely seen an opening video presentation and we, our, uh, we were able to present it courtesy of People Strong. And uh, that had many images quickly passing across the screen. But there was a recurrent phrase, what if, what if. So that hints at the uncertainty of our times. Now, it would be futile if we were to concentrate on the present exigencies, namely the pandemic and the various the vaccination programs and all of that. Well, some of those things are going on apace, but we are particularly interested in what follows thereafter in the post-COVID season. And in particular too, we are concerned about Sri Lanka, what is it that lies in store or can be expected to take place within the workspace of Sri Lanka? The challenges have been many. Now, it was Jack Welch who made uh, this observation in one of his publications. This is what he says, the best team in the field must win or can win best team in the field. In this competitive environment, which we find ourselves in, and Sri Lanka and its people are in a competitive environment with other countries, all of which are now have been leveled to a degree with the same exigencies of the pandemic, but some are obviously able to do a bit better 
than the others. But what of Sri Lanka? That's the question we need to ask. And do we have that prospect of having the best team or is there a great work need in the sphere of education, skill, and then HR, human resources management. So it is expected that our event today will be in fact a learning and sharing opportunity. And we will have some perspectives from different areas. We can also learn from India because we have our panelists, participants from India as well. And also those with a global perspective will be addressing us and sharing their thoughts. So we will learn some lessons that can be learned. Can HR be a game changer? That's a very important question. Can HR be a game changer in business, in enterprise? in the marketplace, HR. Then two, in a country or an economy that obviously needs to compete and recover from what the present is, skills are needed because skills will help in attracting investments into a country. So we might want to ask that question, how is India doing it? What we learn from that experience? Then are there business models that have worked up until now in this past nearly two years, are there business models that one can look at and then learn from and adapt according to what we learn? So the huge amount of work really needs to be done. And then can education and skills ensure that corporate CEOs are able to field that best team that Jack Welch was talking about? What about education? Well, interestingly, there was a survey done not so long ago. It was conducted by Verite here in Sri Lanka and uh, with support and sponsorship of USAID. And that was just a couple of years ago. And they had some fairly disturbing results as a consequence of what turned up in that report. It was called the Youth Labor Market Assessment Sri Lanka. Very briefly, it says that there is evidence of poor school to work transition in the country. That's talking about education. And the statistics that prove it are quite disturbing. Those aged 15 to 35, that's considered to be youth, they stand at 11% unemployment. That's the figure that we have. And 11% unemployment. And those in the 15 to 19 and 20 to 24 age group, that percentage is even higher. Then there's also concern about gender equality. So I will not go into that, but the statistics show up a lot of disturbing things. So those are the general areas of things that we need to concentrate on and learn from. And we have many people of different backgrounds, one and listening. We invite you to be engaged right through because there's a great deal that you can pick up from what will be discussed. We start off with our keynote speakers. And the first off is... Um, the CEO of People Strong, and he was a former CEO of Aeon Hewitt Consulting Services. He's very well known in India. In fact, he's an advisor to the government of India on this very topic of HR. It's with pleasure that we invite Sandeep Chowdhury. Thank you. Thank you, Arun. Uh, thank you, ICC Sri Lanka. Thank you, Ganesh. It's certainly a pleasure for me to get connected with many friends that I hadn't really seen uh, during the course of this pandemic. So uh, truly a pleasure to be a part of this conference. Recording in progress. Uh, certainly, I guess this, this virtual setting looks amazing and yet another example of business innovation and resilience. Uh, if you just look at this pandemic, uh, clearly, I guess what we have gone through, uh, there is nothing that could have actually prepared the humanity for this. In fact, I would just say that when we sit in such conferences, we are certainly one of the very, very few privileged ones to debate and imagine the new normal because there is a very large section of humanity that uh, is or will either perish or take a long term to return back to the levels that they were in 2019. In fact, one of the saddest news that I essentially read 
uh, in the middle of the pandemic in India. And I guess that would largely be true for most of the developing economies, uh, including Sri Lanka, is a reported exodus of children from schools to pick up work because of economic necessity and sustenance. Just this one fact is enough for us to know how difficult it is on people, uh, how fundamentally this is gonna take back nations like ours back and rebuilding is clearly not gonna be easy. So I would urge that each one of us sitting in this conference do start with a prayer of gratitude and promise to serve the underserved. Coming very quickly to, I guess, the topic that we have for today, uh, I guess there's been a lot which is spoken about the transformation, the digital transformation that has taken place and that has got fundamentally accentuated because of COVID. Uh, but it is also at a very different level transformed people's relationship with work and workplace and even with each other. It has been a transformation that raises a whole bunch of questions and maybe even more philosophical ones like, do we need as much at an individual level? And more practical ones, that do we really need that expensive office infrastructure to come together? And is that necessary for us to serve our customers? What I'm going to do in the limited time that I have with you to set the context for this lovely, and I'm very, very certain, a thought-provoking conference is to call out the top five shifts as we are seeing from the world of technology. And the reason I'm gonna be wearing a technology lens is because that is always the cause and effect of every disruption. Uh, and that is fundamentally, I do believe what HR has to solve for in the new normal of both recovery and revival. It will, it will range from restoring trust in people to helping them achieve more while they see less of each other, build a truly learning organization because the only way businesses and individuals like ourselves and large part of our enterprises will only survive and more importantly, shape the culture when we, when we are close, even when we are far. So I would start with the first big shift that we are essentially witnessing uh, is that of what we actually end up calling as a tagline even in People Strong, which is people care is good business. And this is about how HR will fundamentally be the cornerstone function to balance productivity with employee well-being. In short, how do organizations attempt business as usual when everything is profoundly unusual? As the pandemic has forced organizations to reevaluate the legacy operating models, a single truth becomes apparent, and that is organizations that prioritize people concerns will flourish, and that and those who don't will actually wither away. So I do believe that as HR leaders orient business processes to a true people first paradigm, the three guiding themes that will continue to emerge and take prominence, uh, and I do believe should take prominence even in a conference like this, is on empathy, resilience, and empowerment. And with these three words, you can solve for reskilling, you can solve for hiring, you can solve for growth. The second shift that we are seeing is uh, the shift which I uh, call as outcome-mation at work. Now, this is the next tsunami that's going to hit all of us. And outcome-mation fundamentally uh, is, a, is, a, is a coming together of the word outcome and of the word automation. This might sound simple, but it is actually quite radical because it fundamentally challenges the existential cultural fabric of an organization because you're asking every employee, every manager to move out of the post-industrial revolution mindset that has continued for so long, so long until maybe in many companies even today, of that nine to five hours and instead look at their concrete contribution. So it's not gonna be 
about the number of hours, but it's going to be a lot more about what is that you've essentially achieved. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the sad news is that 85% of what we've actually done to adapt and adopt ourselves to the entire pandemic is all that was already available to us. Work from home was a matter of debate in many conferences, but we just shoot it away because we didn't want to go that path and um, embrace it until there was no other option given to us by COVID. MS Teams, Zoom, many of these video applications that are adding to our so-called productivity levels at this point in time were always available. In fact, in O365 and Microsoft, we never even realized that MS Teams was actually coming for free because we thought it was better for me to burn that cash and time to fly down for a, for, for a one hour meeting uh, than to actually be able to transact that over this virtual platform. And now let alone when we don't have one single office, but actually literally every employee's terminal is an office for us. And my biggest worry is that when we talk of a post-COVID world, that terminology to me seems like a bit of, bit of a misnomer. So I do want each one of you to reflect, there isn't gonna be a post-COVID world. It is what it is. And are we gonna be learning from this and taking this into the future? Or are we constantly looking for a post-COVID world so that we can shun everything that has made us survive and be productive in these 18, 24 months, and I don't know for how long will this continue, and literally have that urge to go back to our old ways of working. The third element is, uh, the big shift is around collaboration. And clearly it has emerged as the newest currency that everyone wants to hitch. The best of the organization struggle with collaboration, not because it's easy or it's difficult uh, to enable, but it is very difficult to measure collaboration, especially if you wanna be able to measure collaboration to be contextual, and that actually derives real business outcomes. The fourth shift, as we see, is the democratization of the workplace. Every organization in the world will let go of anywhere between 15 to 50% of the current office space. This is, this is research from the World Economic Forum. The conventional definition in that context, if you were to look at the conventional definition of culture, it is a three-legged stool or a table, whatever you want to call it, that has one leg, which is on leadership behavior. The second one, which which is on workplace practices and policies. And the third is on office infrastructure. And I would challenge that the office infrastructure in entirety and a large base part of the workplace practices and policies will actually be replaced by technology and by the technology-led digital revolution. And hence, investment in HR and work tech almost becomes essential. It's not a good to have, it is almost survival. And hence there will be a convergence that we will essentially see in the knowledge competence of HR in how quickly does it adopt to technology and take it into every single part of serving their employees. Just the way today, if you wanna to be able to serve customers, you can't do that without bringing in technology into every part of selling, branding, marketing, or even doing your customer service. Uh, and all of that is gonna be very, very applicable as you look at engaging with your employees. And the fifth and the last one is the variableization of workforce and the complex management associated with it. Few things are quite clear to us. Firstly, at least 50% of the workforce, as we know, will continue to operate virtually in, in, in more sectors than we actually think we can allow that virtual engagement with people. That is the way it's going to be. I would challenge even for manufacturing. Today, when we talk to our 
automotive clients in India, for them to be able to tap into the talent that they need to make that transition from fossil combustion-based fuel technology into the EV technology, the talent is not available in Bangalore or Tamil Nadu or other places where they have their factories. And they're using the virtual way of engaging with talent and hiring them from wherever they are available and wherever they wish to operate from. So clearly increasing model of even industrial and manufacturing businesses will have larger and larger part of their workforce that will be variableized and that will be operating virtually. Now the, variabilize, now the variabilization of workforce essentially is going to be forced by cost. It's going to be immediate availability of talent in the location that I want and to be able to leverage the best of the jobs. You've heard of a unicorn in India, which is Ola, the founder of Ola Bhavish. Uh, people say maybe he was, he, was, he was just being witty when he, when he wrote on his LinkedIn that for us to access better digital talent at cheaper price points, we are thinking of outsourcing our digital work to San Francisco from Bangalore. Uh, maybe there was a pun intended, but fundamentally, that is exactly how every, com every company is going to start redefining the talent catchment area for themselves. So you will be able to tap into a labor pool, which is not in your own country, not in your own time zone. Uh, and with everything that we've essentially spoken about, be a lot more focused on outcomes. You will have people in your workforce that will be on multiple employments and not just one committed permanent employment with one, one enterprise. In conclusion, uh, none of these uh, are long-term shifts. We are seeing them evolve. We are seeing them take shape every day. These are, these are what I do believe something that we can see with our naked eye because it's happening here and now. So the shift is already taking place. It's literally a bit of a wake-up call for organizations who are either resisting or kind of slow to adapt to this kind of a shift and challenge. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, all this will change the role of HR immensely. It sounds like a cliche, but it is, it is a truth. I imagine HR as a new Iron Man of the world of work, it, equipped with its own uh, very own Javis. Uh, which can never replace him, but augments the work that it, that it does. And that HR will fundamentally be technology. Uh, we all love the game of cricket in Sri Lanka and in India. And one of the things we've learned from cricket is uh, the need for teamwork and collaboration. Just knowing where everybody else is on the field and playing together and playing to a strategy. Imagine HR and technology as a relationship of just putting the right field placement for us on a device and breaking a five day test match into a smaller series of T20s. That's happening even today. Uh, and that's really how captains are trying to strategize it. But maybe it is not visible to our, our naked eye. So uh, that's really what I had to set the context for far more experienced and, and wise uh, leaders who are going to follow uh, from here on uh, to talk about the future of work, the future of HR, and the future of, of, of skill uh, in the context of Sri Lanka and its economy that I've always wished the best for. Thank you. Thank you, Dinesh, and thank you, ICC, for again having me uh, as a part of this wonderful gathering. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sandeep. We would invite you to stay with us a little longer until the other speakers are done, and we will invite Chandi to perhaps direct a question to you to clarify if there's any need to do that. But we understood your emphasis on the big shift not in one area, but several, but with technology being one of the key instruments of that big shift uh, in HR. Thank you. Now we would like to focus on um, Irene Teng, who's the Managing Director, Global Markets for AICPA CIMA, and she joins us 
from Malaysia. So, Irene. Thank you, Mr. Arun. Just one. So thank you, Mr. Arun. And you know, thanks again uh, to ICC for actually inviting me uh, to be in this event as well. And really hello and good day to uh, ladies and gentlemen who actually join us today. It is indeed a pleasure to be with you and uh, to speak about the developing uh, new leaders for a changing world. And indeed, you know, from this first uh, speaker just now, you know, we talk so much about how the world has changed uh, so much since the onset of the pandemic in early 2020. Uh, there are new business models, you know, new consumer behavior, um, new focus and priorities for businesses, new challenges, and the list is just endless. So when change accelerates, uh, so does the need to learn. The way we develop new leaders, the way we skill them, and the way they learn in order to be continuously relevant for the times is just so important. So today I will touch on the current learning landscape, uh, the changes and shift that we need to be mindful of, um, the top skill needed by 2025, and how CIMA being a leader in the accounting profession has reimagined its learning curriculum for future leaders. So for generations, we have spent the first third of our lives acquiring the college degrees we need to find jobs. And these degrees pave the way for the remaining two thirds of our life. Now, this implies that the nature of our work, uh, along with the skills and knowledge required to execute it, remains unchanged for a lifetime, which, of course, is no longer true. So this World Economic Forum article, as you can see here, which I'm sharing, highlighted that because of technology, there is an unprecedented and rapid rise in new kinds of digital jobs. Uh, roles at the forefront of the data um, and AI economy, as well as new roles in engineering, cloud computing, and product development. Now, these jobs need talent with re relevant skills. And importantly, these skills can be learned even by those without college degrees. And we all know that it is digital first now in a COVID world. The nature of work and careers is changing fast, and in the future, the right skills will be priced over academic qualifications alone. Now, in recent years, several companies, including EY, um, Google, and IBM, have embraced this kind of thinking and have increased hiring from alternate talent, talent pools, and several more are also investing in continuous learning for the workforce. So others like uh, Infosys, they have also brought together a consortium of partners on a free online platform to provide job training and apprenticeship opportunities for job seekers uh, to connect them with employers, offering them new work streams and career pathway. Now, using a three or four year degree to enhance employability means relying on talent with potentially redundant skills rather than lifelong learners with ever relevant skills. Now, this is the shift we must be mindful of. Skills and not degrees will shape the future of work. We can also see the impact of COVID-19 on college education. When colleges shut down and went to remote classes, many students chose to take time off, a gap year or some of them even a gap semester. Now, others did not want a diminished college experience as most universities went online. Uh, internship, you know, jobs and study abroad opportunities were all canceled. So the number of students taking the gap year has increased significantly. And for some students, the gap year is giving them time to think about what they really want to do with their future and explore the fields they are really interested in. So for students who decided to take time off because of financial or other hardships, there is a very real concern they may not return to college. 
Now, statistics have shown that university enrollment has dropped in 2020, and many students could no longer afford to enroll. Jobless rates have increased, affecting the income of many families. Now, the shift that we must consider here is that the university model is changing. COVID has shown that the current business model is no longer sustainable. In fact, university education has significantly lagged behind other industries in moving to a more digitally driven outcomes focused business model. Now, with the rapidly involving um, talent needs of employers and the increase in jobs leveraging on AI, robotics, and other technologies, universities are also struggling to keep their curriculum current. Now, with the trends in the future of work, there could be a departure from the three or four year degree model in favor of um, lifetime learning. I want to touch on Gen Z and their approach to learning and work. Now, Gen Z are those born between 1997 and 2007. And this is the first generation to have been born entirely in the internet age. They form the largest uh, generational cohort in history, and their attitudes and expectations are poised to shape the next normal. Now, a recent study by EY Ripples and JA Worldwide of nearly 6,000 Gen Z youth all over the world reveals a generation of young people who are highly engaged and who feel only somewhat prepared, uh, yet largely optimistic about the future. They are eager for more hands-on experiential learning opportunities, um, especially in topics related to global citizenship and the environment. And they feel that their education should not be limited to the classroom and that business should be stepping up to offer new forms of learning. The Gen Z are also asking for educators to offer innovative and creative learning opportunities that augment traditional teaching methods and for businesses to support their development and education. Now, when they were asked to rank how the education system could be improved, majority of the Gen Z respondents stated a preference for greater exposure to real life work and professional mentorship, uh, making this the two most popular responses. They rank traditional teaching methods of lectures, student teaching, and field trips you know, as the lowest out of the 10 options given. And the Gen Z, they also rated more traditional school subjects as less important than future focus, you know, like the pro-social topics such as environmental literacy and global citizenship. They also convey a yearning for more school courses focused on career development and financial literacy. Now, with this finding, the shift that we must take into account is that the desires and ambitions of Gen Z, which is the largest generational cohort now, they are coming on stream into the workplace. The World Economic Forum you know, has actually listed the 10 skills needed by 2025. And in this, you know, uh, publication is that half of us will need to reskill in the next five years as the double disruption of the economic impacts of the pandemic and increased automation transforming jobs takes hold. So critical thinking and problem solving top the list of skills which employers believe will grow in prominence in the next five years. Uh, newly emerging uh, skills in self-management, such as active learning, resilience, uh, stress tolerance, and flexibility. And with the greater adoption of technology, it will mean that in-demand skills across jobs will change over the next five years and skill gaps will continue to be high. So you heard me talking about the changing learning landscape and how it's now about skills and not degrees, how the university model is changing, how Gen Z with their unique desire and ambitions are coming into the workplace and what are the top 10 skills needed moving forward? So as a leading professional accounting body, our journey in developing new leaders for a changing world started as far back in 2015. 
we realized the impact of technology on learning and assessment, and we adapted accordingly. We introduce computer-based assessment, which can be taken on demand. And you know, I'm proudly to say that we were the first professional body to do so. And in 2019, even before the pandemic, we have already introduced uh, digital skills as a core in our competency framework. And again, you know, I'm proud to say that our syllabus is unmatched in rigor and relevance as it is based on a global research with employers and all stakeholders. Now, last year, when the pandemic hit us in March, we introduced remote exam for our students in May 2020. And, uh, you know, remote exam means uh, the exam can be taken at home uh, instead of being at a test center. And we are grateful that technology allowed this to happen and our students were able to progress through the qualification without any interruption. So, in 2020, we also introduced our CGMA Finance Leadership Program, or in short, FLP, uh, where students can learn the CIMA qualification entirely online and uh, take assessments as they learn, all on a single platform. It provides a digital solution that puts learners at the forefront of the skills race. So FLP actually is the switch to flexible learning for students and you know, as I've actually presented, you know, what the Generation Z is all about, and hopefully through this FLP, we have transformed our educational delivery and gave control of learning to the students. And students, you know, all over the world, no matter where they are, you know, they would have access to the same platform, the same learning material, and the same quality of delivery. Not all students, though will want to learn the whole CIMA qualification. And just like you know, spending three or four years on a degree, they are more likely now to want shorter programs or specific certification instead of structured learning. Learn, unlearn, relearn is today's the name of the game. And it's all about being relevant to the times amid the fast changes happening around us. Now, our CGMA stores provide this flexibility for short programs and certificate courses. It can range from IFRS certificate program and cybersecurity to data analytics, AI and machine learning, blockchain, et cetera, et cetera. And the list will just keep going. So in essence, CIMA has a core learning program in its professional qualification, which is based on um, this competency framework that you see here. It is a holistic framework that covers technical, business, leadership, people, and digital skills. These are the skills that employers have said they are looking for in talent they hire. Now, these skills also tie in with the top 10 skills mentioned by the World Economic Forum for 2025. And once qualified, the finance professional undergoes lifelong learning through short courses and certificate programs available on our CGMA store to remain relevant. Now, through these two routes, we develop new leaders that are ready to lead change and help businesses build resilience and be sustainable for the future. Now, ladies and gentlemen, in this turbulent era, the only constant is the need to learn, adapt, and change. That is what CIMA has been doing over the past 100 years. Now, being relevant to the times, constantly adapting and innovating is key to being a centenarian. And that is how we are developing new leaders who are fit for business. Thank you. Back to you, Mr. Arun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Irene. We really appreciated the insights that you brought in at the initial part of your presentation. And of course, as we understood, uh, myself, is, is likelihood that there will be a question that you might uh, be asked to respond to. Now we move to the third of our speakers and a perspective from within our own country. And one who is well able to provide that, he in fact did address uh, a human capital uh, conference a few years ago and was able to trace the real situation as exists in this country. So I'd like to invite the founder of CMA, uh, Professor Lakshman, uh, to share with us 
his insights. Thank you very much, uh, Arun. I am uh, indeed uh, thankful to the chairman of the International Chamber of Commerce of Sri Lanka, Mr. Dinesh Virakudi, for inviting me to speak a few words on the Sri Lankan side, you know, because I think uh, we've heard the international side. So uh, there are very many areas that need to be told about it. And of course, I must, I'm also happy to note that Daily FT uh, is also involved in it because uh, because uh, maybe uh, I've been writing a number of articles and it was in uh, 2019 that I published an article on additional 100,000 university places for GCA level qualified students. Uh, that appeared on the 19th of December 2019 in Delhi FT, uh, just after the elections of the current government. So what I just want to tell you is uh, today uh, we are I think we have a very high profile, uh, maybe HR and CEOs and others. But what we really have to see is action has to take place because uh, you may be happy to note that the uh, uh, human resource area is very, very prominently uh, uh, stated in the manifesto of the president, His Excellency Gotabe Rajapaksa. So this uh, is something that is very, very prominently displayed and uh, most of the things that are mentioned are the things that I want to discuss today. Because uh, first of all, I would like to tell you about the, maybe if I start, maybe from the school level, although many people say that uh, uh, the school education has to be changed, I must tell you that they are working to a pattern, you know, because they have maybe 10 years education, 12 years education, uh, they sit for exams, they get the results, and then the whole rut starts. But then look at the results. Now we see now actually in the 2020, uh, we had uh, 301,000 uh, sitting, 194,000 getting through, of course, percentage of 64%. And uh, how many can enter university? Now that is the biggest problem. They have increased now, I may be from 30,000 to they say 40, 41,000 they are going to get. So you see that there is a very big gap. And today I think those who are here on the panel need to see how this gap could be met because we are all talking, 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 but no action, action, action. So we need to see because this is specifically stated in the report, but I must, uh, I'm, I was just looking for the action plan, you know, when you have a, uh, all you pri people from the private sector, will you know that when you have a plan, uh, you have a strategy, you have an action plan. Now that's what we need to fill the gap because the action plan, we have to put this into action. So then when you look at the results, look at uh, the number of uh, art students who are passing out, maybe about 60,000 art students. Has our education system in the school level done anything? What are we doing? We should see that uh, there are more science students, more technical students, uh, more mathematics students, more uh, who are passing out, but that is something what we call value creation. Today in this country, there is no value creation. Everyone is using the money, but unfortunately, there is no value creation. So the target should be set. Maybe if the ministry is concerned, every year you reduce by 50% the art students, and then you will get uh, the science students coming in. These are not very big problems because ultimately the people who suffer are people who are in the rural areas, the poor children. But uh, in the manifesto of the president, uh, he has said that the sustainability development goals, the 17 sustainability development goals will be uh, put into action. So that's why I'm saying action has to come. So we professionals, we HR managers, we CEOs, don't think that you are going to get everything uh, from the government. You need to work for it. So that's what I say today, we need to look at the private public partnership. That was what my article that I mentioned, because if you see the universities can take maybe 35,000, 40,000, how are the others going to come? Now, today we need technology. We need uh, uh, the people who are going to be trained in uh, IT, in engineering and all those. So we need the technological university to come. So if this technological university is there, then it has to link up with the private sector. It will have maybe 100 private colleges then you can meet the targets. I'm just talking of the, uh, what is done in India. Pune University has 600 colleges. It has increased to 811 colleges, maybe uh, 750,000 students. So these are very, very simple things, you know, we can do it.
but we need to come out of the system and then do it. Then the professional education. It is also mentioned in the uh, uh, manifesto of the uh, excellency, the president, that professional education, but I have never heard them talking of professional education because we can give another 50,000 places uh, for the people because our professional education is academic plus training, the skill development, then they are ready to get a job. If you ask the bankers here, I think Isuru is there, he will say, I will prefer to take an A-level person, I will train him, I will get him to see the banker's exam, and then he will go up the ladder. But in the case of people who are passing out 25, 26 years, no, you must pass out at 21 or 22, uh, maximum 23, then the private sector will take you. So I think there are a lot of matters uh, that are really there, but these are very, very simple things. But I think the COVID-19 has really changed our minds. What we, were, what we could not do digitally, now today even this uh, seminar that we have, conference that we are having, it's done digitally because we were forced to do it. I think Sri Lanka is a country that will do things when you are forced to do it. You will not take, if you are given maybe some option, you will say, I will do tomorrow. That is not the way to do things, you know, because immediately we had to change when the lockdown was there, we were using so many WhatsApp and everything to get our food. So that's why the education today uh, can we really need a big change, but get the private sector involved. Private sector has to play the key role. If you just say government has to do it, nothing will happen. Because I can tell you, I have set up institutes with zero capital. A a Association of Accounting Technicians of Sri Lanka was set up by me without any money. Today they have 1 billion rupee worth of assets, 30, 30 odd thousand people who are qualified, 20, uh, 30 thousand students. CMA is similar, another professional body. So if the government gives us a challenge, we are prepared to accept it. But no one speaks to us. They call all the university people, all their colleagues, and they will talk the same thing. So I think today we need change. And if we change it, I'm sure we can take Sri Lanka to prosperity and also implement the good messages that are given in the manifesto of His Excellency, the president uh, of this country. Thank you very much. Thank you. A wake up call that you issued to everybody. Yeah, let's talk more action and the involvement of the private. Now, I thank very much at this juncture, Chandi, who uh, is our moderator. Uh, and uh, I would like to invite her to take over and uh, direct some questions uh, to the three of our speakers. So, Chandi uh, Dhammaratna is the vice president of HR for Virtusa. So please, let's hear from Chandi. Thanks, Arun. I think there were three great uh, presentations and keynotes, very valuable. The first question that I have is for Sandeep. Sandeep, uh, I'm going to go back into a interview that you have done a while back and start off from there, where you said our fundamental education philosophy needs to undergo major change and start meeting industry requirements. Please elaborate on how this can, can be achieved. So um, thank you, Chandi. Yeah, I'm kind of a little impressed at how you've been keeping track of multiple things that I would have said in the Sri Lankan context. Uh, you know, clearly, if you look at uh, countries like ours, and I'm looking at the education system, which is in India, which is in Sri Lanka, which is in other neighboring countries, uh, actually quite the same because that was fundamentally, that was set up uh, long, long back in terms of its curriculum assessment framework and everything um, that dates back to several decades. Uh, well, all just about imparting learning uh, uh, as opposed to imparting skills. Uh, so it stayed a lot more relevant uh, till your high school level, because at that point in time, you're fundamentally just creating a mind in a student, which is mature, fertile, to now start absorbing, reflecting, and thinking on its own. After that, if you are still continuing on the same graph of learning as opposed to uh, skills. So there has to be uh, 
learning after high school education that has to pivot towards creating employability. So if you're not impacting that part of ability, you're fundamentally just going to be creating qualified people who are not employable. And that's exactly what the challenge is in countries like Sri Lanka, et cetera, where we don't have a dearth of graduates or undergraduates or masters in any field that you really want to pick. We unfortunately have a dirt and only a fraction of them are considered to be employable because of their employability quotient. Uh, fundamentally, if you look at uh, programs that countries like Germany and many others have essentially been able to put is very quickly try and put students into vocational areas where they are actually being built for a particular industry. In fact, one of the biggest skills that we are essentially seeing being required both in the public as well as in the private sector, any cross-section of industry is a lot more around your, your problem-solving ability, is a lot more about your emotionality and your, and your emotional quotient. It's a lot more about your digital prowessness and digital skill set, customer centricity and so on and so forth now, this is not even remotely connected with the subjects that we are essentially teaching only from an academic standpoint in our colleges, institutions, and universities. So I do believe that there has to be a very, very strong public-private partnership and not just creating more institutions, because I think we've done a fabulous job of that today. India has more private colleges and universities than the, the, the public or the government universities and you know they're just solving for a very different purpose but clearly not solving for the purpose of creating more and more people students that are employable i would argue literally every job even a delivery boy or a girl's job requires them to read and decipher and work on technology uh, and now if you're not bringing that in, now what, what creates a better delivery person than, than someone else? It's a lot more around the customer centricity. It's a lot more around the things that we essentially spoke about. And this is the matrix that I, I believe needs to be created across every industry. Hospitality needs very different from what manufacturing needs. Technology needs very different from what a, a more of a process industry like a cement or a steel uh, would essentially require. So the focus clearly needs to be on imparting skills rather than education. And I don't think we can take pride in saying we still have produced so many engineers and doctors that are revered in the world uh, because you know that in my opinion is um, uh, is an outcome of a very, very large population that we're talking about and a very intelligent population. Uh, out of that, if you're creating 1% really employable at the global level, uh, we are missing out on the 99, which unfortunately have spent all of their time, money, and energy in getting that qualification, but not finding any useful or meaningful employment. Thank you, Sandeep. Thank you. It's a very elaborative answer. I did have a lot more questions, mainly about the fourth industrial revolution and um, some areas that you mentioned, but we'll just uh, keep it for a minute. And I want to go to Irene. Irene, actually, you answered the question that I had written down. So, and you did an amazing job in really explaining what you do at CIMA. But I thought I'll just catch up on one thing that you mentioned. You mentioned um, a few things that you mentioned. You mentioned about the importance of uh, Generation Z. And you also talked about the, um, you know, the inculcate, how we need to inculcate the importance of lifelong learning versus just getting a degree. Um, so how do you at CIMA look at Generation Z and uh, kind of uh, change the way that you deliver to inculcate that importance or the importance of lifelong learning to the Gen Zs? Because I'm assuming it's different from different generations that you worked with. Yes, okay. you're, so please. Right. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Ms. Chandy. Yeah, you're right. So 
You see, the thing is with the Gen Z and over in Sri Lanka, majority of the population now, most of our students are from the younger uh, generation. So, you know, with FLP, actually, we already offer FLP, you know, in Sri Lanka. And we actually reach out to this generation, you know, through all the university programs that are actually available in, in Sri Lanka. So we have actually worked with various universities, the public and, and um, the uh, um, private universities. So a few of the universities that we work with, like, you know, University of Western Scotland, I know with um, ICBS, uh, NSBM, you know, and uh, Colombo University, Sri Lanka Institute of Institute of Technology, just, just to name a few. And through the university, obviously, we get them actually exposed to what all this digital learning is, right, and what kind of skills that they actually need. But on top of that, once they qualify our qualification, they need to actually understand the importance of lifelong learning because it's about their relevance. You know, it's all about their career progression. It's about, you know, how do they ensure that they're keeping pace with the change, uh, you know, right, right in front of them in the future. So the uh, qualification that they actually acquire from us is just you know, the base, the beginning of their journey. But being our members, obviously, we will continue to actually encourage them to take short certification. We will actually create the awareness as to what are the in-trend skills that they need to, you know, uh, make themselves, um, you know, up to date with. And most importantly is other than engaging them directly as our members, we also reach out to employers. Uh, corporate partners, obviously, is our key partners in ensuring that all this learning, skills development will be an ongoing effort, not just SEMA as a professional body. We got to work hand in hand with the employers. So hopefully, yeah, hopefully, you know, with that, we are able, you know, to, to reach out to them and also to create that awareness among the employers as much as we're getting a lot of inputs from the employers, because you can see that's how we, you know, update and, and revise our syllabus to make it relevant we will also continue you know, to create that awareness with the employers as to what are some of the skills that we think is actually required with the changing business landscape that is obviously ongoing. So I think it takes you know, parties to collaborate to work on this, uh, but I think you know, uh, moving forward, now we're talking about Gen Z, you know, what about the millennial, what about the future generation? So again, for SEMA, as an education and a professional body, we just got to keep ourselves, you know, remain relevant and pace ourselves, you know, in, in order Thank to you. enjoy the relevance of our members and students. Thank you, Irene. A very elaborative answer. Thank you so much. Um, um, Professor Waterweller, we have a few minutes if you can answer quick. The question we have is, uh, and I think you mentioned this multiple times in different forums as well, the clear mismatch between the current curriculum and the existing labor market demand, labor market demand. In your opinion, should the government, what action should the government take in order to bridge that gap? Yeah, actually, I think uh, we are all looking at the government. You know, I feel it is, as I said earlier, it has to be a public-private partnership. Now, skill development, if it is at the lower level, definitely uh, it has to uh, be the training that is really required. Because I know that maybe those days, there were people who were uh, trained, you know, now if you take a mechanic, he will be uh, working in the institution and then maybe in the after evening, they will go for lectures. Now, those are the sort of good habits that have really been lost, you know. Now it is all, everyone is saying, go and get this qualification, that qualification. But the practical experience is very essential. Then on the, maybe the, uh, the degree graduates, now the basic problem more than quality is the age, you know. No private sector person will take a person at 24 or 25 because you want a young person to be trained. If you pass out at 21, 22, then you will get a job, you know. So quality is really the right sort of course, you know. You produce so many arts graduates. What is the real use? Actually, it is the fault of the universities. When the arts graduates come, they must teach them maybe IT, communication, English, which will make them employable. But what are they doing? They are just talking nonsense, no? They are wasting the money, no value generation. So I think we have to make a complete change and the private sector has to come. If the private sector is given this task to work with the government, they will really make it. Great. Thank you, Professor Lapatola. Thank you. Over to you, Arun. Thanks. Thanks very much. And uh, those were topics that were there or brought to the surface, which obviously needs to be discussed further and thought about. Right now, the panel... The panel, we have 14 persons from different places. 
We start off with Ravi Pires, who's the senior specialist, South Asia for the International Labour Organization, or ILO. Good to have you with us, Ravi. And Hi, Aaron. Thank you. Thank you very much. From India, Mahesh Manekarat and CEO, Citizens and Business Finance, PLC. Then we have Mr. N. Ahmed Ali, who is the founder of HR Konkupia South Asia and also a, a former VP for HR with GSK uh, in South Asia. Then we have another very experienced former chairman of GSK Consumer and also Director of Professional Skills Council of India, and that's Mr. P. Garkanath. Welcome. Then we have the chairman of the People's Bank and managing partner of BDO Partners, Mr. Sujiva Rajapaksha, Dr. Mahesha Ranasoma, who is the CEO of Global Rubber Industries, then Mr. Prakhar Tripathi, who is the Director of the Human Capital Advisory Services for Deloitte. We also have from the United States, an international HR specialist in Chitral Amrasiri. Then a senior lecturer in law at the University of Greenwich, in the United Kingdom, Professor Justin uh, Branskell. Surani Amrasinghe is the head of HR for Lion Brewery Salon. Isuru Gunasekara, Chief People Officer with John Keel's Holdings Group. And Kaushal Mendes, who is the HR Director for Pizza Hut at Taco Bell. Isuru who is the and last and certainly not least, Roshan Kulasuriya, Director HR at Singer. So that's our panel. And now back to Tandi, who will take the first portion of the questions to the panel and discuss, etc. And then we'll have a change a little later on. Tandi? Hi, thanks, Arun. So the first question we have goes to uh, Ravi. Um, let's keep it really brief. I hope we can have more leading questions as a result of that. So Ravi, the first question is, especially in the current context, in your opinion, can you elaborate on the importance of education and skills as a nation? Thank you very much, uh, Chandi, and thank you very much, Dinesh and the ICCL for inviting me. It's really nice to see a lot of familiar faces and connecting with you after some time. Uh, well, education has been something uh, very close to my heart since my childhood. In fact, uh, I had the unique privilege of living inside the premises of a private girls' school for 23 years and attending school in a private boys' school for 12 and a half years. The paradoxical mismatch between the needs of employers and the skills of its labor force remains a challenge. And this is something we keep on talking about. People without jobs, and jobs without people. The questions arise, what skills should today's youth be taught? What skills do employers seek out? Why is there such an apparent mismatch between the two? The answers to these begin and end with education. During my time in school, education was very much a top-down approach. I teach, you listen. Questions were not much encouraged. But today with the explosion of the internet, content is no longer confined to the wall, four walls of a classroom or lecture hall. Students can access the same content being taught in their physical classroom online. They have the added benefit of being able to progress and internalize the material at their own pace. But unfortunately, very often, Knowledge acquisition is sought purely for acquiring qualifications. Sometimes you are preoccupied with gaining knowledge and acquiring qualifications as opposed to directing that knowledge towards a skill that would result in gainful employment. The focal point of education is to impart the ability to learn, not just to know, but possessing the skill of learning to learn. The goal of education as a whole, be it the university, high school, or kindergarten, must change. Do not teach for mere test scores. Teach for mastery. 
create a student with the skill of constantly being able to learn. That is the student tomorrow's employers will look for. The student that will be equipped to adapt to the permeability of tomorrow's job market. The student who loves and knows to learn. It is now becoming evident that the aspirations of the younger generation are moving towards a new social compact with more flexibility and opportunities for self-development. The fourth industrial revolution has created an entrepreneurial thirst that needs to be acknowledged and nurtured. It is equally important that education focuses on entrepreneurship, which is needed for job creation and growth. Entrepreneurship education benefits students from all socioeconomic backgrounds because it teaches children to think outside the box and nurtures unconventional talents and skills. It also creates the opportunity, ensures social justice, instills confidence, and stimulates the economy. Competition has been the name of the game ever since the evolution of the world. Competition has intensified over the years with much ruthlessness bringing about sharp disparities and inequalities, notwithstanding the development and growth that has been taking place around us. It has eroded values of integrity and honesty in sport, and there has been a race to the top to win at any cost. Having said that, it was certainly a breath of fresh air to witness athletes sharing gold medals by choice at the recent Olympics. We need to create a learning model that would promote cooperation over competition and culture of shared growth from the kindergarten to university. A Thank you, Ravi. Ravi, I'm just gonna take uh, a small break from there. Yes. I think, uh, and come back to you, Ravi, with the interest of time. Um, sure. I think it was a very, very uh, comprehensive, uh, you know, uh, summary of, uh, you know, the importance of education. Next question goes to Chitral. Chitral, from that, um, do you think our, in, our education system is ready to meet the requirements that we have as organizations? If not, how do we get there, in your opinion? Thank you, Chandi. Uh, uh, this is a very interesting question. Um, when the education system of a country is ready to meet the industrial requirements, in other words, effectively contribute to the economy, we should experience high productivity and growth and per capita income. This is possible when the education system ensures all students, in spite of their gender, economic prosperity, or geographical location, those students have access to learning. And such an education system should encourage entrepreneurship and innovation in the process of learning. And then the successful education system should facilitate labor mobility and job matching the, in the sense of the supply, the output of the education system meets the demand, the need of the industry. Now, do we have that? We are not, no longer there. The Sri Lanka economy since 1970s, we are moving from agrarian to a more mixed economy and Today, we are trying to become an industrial economy, but our competitiveness is in the service-based economy. So our priority sectors today are the tourism, uh, light manufacturing, ICT, logistic, and the agriculture. So the industry, the private sector demand matching technical skills and also soft skills to facilitate this economic transformation. So our education system is still struggling to ensure that all youth are ready with the required technical skills connected to those priority sectors and ready with the right soft skills. As someone said earlier, the problem solving, the resilience, the confidence, decision-making, collaborations, in addition to those technical skills. So our labor productivities is a result of the short supply of a skilled labor. And sadly, the skill gap seems to be widening, especially highly skilled industries. The shortage of skilled labor deprives the industrial growth. And all this about readiness of an education system to support industrial growth, the economic prosperity. So the uh, education system should be flexible enough to respond to the industry and economy. I mean, the successfully respond to the changes in the labor market demand. So currently, uh, the technical vocation program, Black 
quality of the labor market relevant. The graduates enter the labor market with skills that are not well matched with demand in the labor market. That's what Professor Waterwell mentioned a little while ago. And another issue is that the system is that the students are taking a longer than is normal needed to the graduates due to the inefficiencies and the disruptions of the university in the education. So let me quickly uh, jump into the, uh, uh, the, the other important areas that the enrollment in higher education in relation to GDP per capita is much lower than in the Sri Lanka, is much lower than the comparable similar countries. We are very much compared to the lower income country. So that the public spending on education, technical and vocation training should be increased in order to address some of these issues. But more importantly, the more importantly, the active involvement of the private sector is critically, critically important on three areas that I see. The firstly, the curriculum designing. Secondly, the delivery. And thirdly, the measurement and the quality assurance. And also I see that uh, the public finance on higher education or vocation and training, uh, skills training should be linked to the student performance. And, and that way you will be able to ensure that all this investment, there is a return on investment. You see the education sector in Sri Lanka is very complex and fragmented. It needs huge stakeholder participation sector coordinators, uh, coordination across various ministries, agencies, multiple statutory board, provincial authorities, local governments. And then they also need to find a way to bring the private sector to the designing table, as I mentioned, on the three areas, the curriculum designing, the delivery, and the measurement of the quality assurance. Thank you, Chitra. I'm going to uh, come back to you. Next right. question. Thank you so much. Next question is to Mr. Dwar uh, Dwarakanath. Um, India launched a mission to scale 400 million by 2022. This is supported by many industry leaders in India. As a director, Professional Skills Council India, please share your views on the importance of such collaborations to bridge the skills gap. And I think that's what we are talking about now in the previous, in the previous panelists as well. Very thank quick you. answers to our Kanath, please. So, thank you, great question. At the outset, I wish to thank Dinesh Virakodi and ICC for uh, asked me to join this panel. I'm privileged and honored to be here. Uh, very quickly to say, it's a great initiative. This is one of the initiatives where Prime Minister Modi has started about five years back when he created a digital India and make India. I think in India, as the saying goes, we have plenty of people, but you don't have right kind of people to do the jobs. And he felt it is not just feeding a hungry man, but to provide him how to do fishing. This is where the skills have programs have started. I must say very quickly in a one minute, I need to say to give the context. This is not something for urban. This is not something for only enlightened class. This is where the, the, the uniqueness of this program, which also talks about many other schemes like rural India skill program. It is focused on youth uh, as well as matured, educated and senior people, but is focused more not only in the urban, but also in the rural. It is not just for some educated classes, but for everything. It covers from a traditional skills, from a carpentry to a wobbler or welder to tailor, and also to some of the industries. I think like, uh, for example, Sri Lanka will be very much interested to know how to develop skills in jewelry designing, uh, regarding gems, uh, gems industry, as far as the tourism and banking and so on. So, one of the things on the public-private partnership, the uniqueness is that it is, as Professor Lakshman said very well, it cannot be done by the government alone. It requires government can energize, motivate, provide some intensives, encourage some, in, give some infrastructure and so on. But it is the people through private industries, through uh, NGOs, through management professional bodies who can do this. So they've created 37, 37, skill sector councils. And you know, I need to say specifically, it may be very interesting to SEMA and ICCI. This is where I'm a director for management, entrepreneurship and, and skills council, which provides this a sponsor of this sector hub is being empowered. There's an empowerment here. It's not that government in a bureaucratic way sitting over you. You have been empowered. This is be this hub, this is sponsored by All India Management Association. So they, they have been given this, empowered with this. They certify 
from the, all these you depending on the skills competency and assessment very elaborate process i can't discuss we can discuss offline which means it's an encouragement through industry leaders where, for instance in housing lot of companies are encouraging construction many ports have been built to it and management and professional bodies like iim and cii are also coming into play it is not left to the only private sector industries that is why i said it is a great collaborative effort many competitors be it in a construction company in a banking or a financial services are coming together for a noble cause it is for the upliftment of youth especially those who are economically and socially backward areas to encourage them to help them and also to create before i end up one point it is not just giving the skills in terms of get a job i think you know this is where somebody said it at their previous speakers to develop that entrepreneurial skills so that they can self manage and they can do the self uh, skilling and help them to learn and the last bit i want to say they are not ending with giving a skills reskilling relearning is also a process of it no doubt we had high ambitious plan due to pandemic we need to uh, trim them a little bit but i'm sure it will go into the full gear so it's a great example thank of thank you a partnership thank you mr darkanath i think that was very elaborative uh, kausha what can the private sector do to overcome the lack of skilled employable talent in the industry in sri lanka thank you chandi for the question um, so uh, one of the, since since our colleagues uh, spoke of uh, the corporate level employees in this question i will primarily look at uh, the entry level positions chandi now in the recent past what we've been hearing is that we we have a lack of um, supply at the lower levels where a guy who's just out of school will get a trisho and become a trisho driver or else uh, no one is there to walk into the apparel industry which generates foreign income so we can keep on grumbling about it but being corporates i think we need to take the lead so in 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 that i echo a uh, professor watervelles comments where this cannot be a, a single man's agenda so no single no no uh, single hand cannot clap so there has to be two foot angle so uh, there there what we need to do is we need to write the uh, we need to find the right partner to develop this collaboration and to take it forward and to create that uh, skills matrix which is required for the industry so chandi rather than telling about this uh, the, the the concept i will take up the the audience through an example what we did now i work for pizza hut which is sorry really quickly question yes i work for pizza hut which is the largest restaurant company in sri lanka we find it really difficult to find people we need about 1000 people with our expansions and the national attrition so what we did was rather than grumbling we uh, we developed a national competency standard along with the government and we pledged our support to the government to build about 60 vocational training centers which will develop youth about 2500 qualified certified employable youth who are ready to walk into the industry so uh, by doing that what we try to do is we are trying to create a youth pool of talent who will have dignity who will have hope and who will have acceleration in their careers both locally and overseas so i think being a corporate all what we want to do is to wear that corporate citizenship that hat and to ensure to create what is required there what is the required skill set to for a better industry as mr amar chitra lamar sir said uh, to create uh, productivity and enhance uh, the the standards of in the industry in sri lanka great thank you kaushal um, professor justin how do you think the academic institutions can help address this skills gap I'd like to start by uh, just thanking you all for having me here. It's um, I'm very proud to be invited, and actually feel quite humbled by the talent uh, that's obviously on display. Um, on addressing you know, the question, I've got to say that I agree entirely with the idea that lifelong learning is vital, and education should never stop. It's something that in itself should never be called considered finished. Now, education itself. is vital for imparting skills and more importantly the knowledge to acquire further skills and in my uh, field which is a uh, law 
so not really the industrial skills people are looking for. Although, in a uh, past life, you know, before I retrained as a lawyer, I did spend a long time in engineering, and I do quite understand the uh, basic skills gap that's being talked about. Um, what we, uh, we impart is a framework for understanding, a framework that can be built on later. And not only do we try and impart academic skills, but we're looking at soft skills and employability, providing work experience, and critically, things such as research skills and problem solving ability. And it's these research skills and problem solving ability built in with some confidence in your own ability and resilience um, to challenges that education can give you alongside the academics, but actually set people up for the lifelong learning and acquiring the skills they need as they go ahead. Nobody um, is pretending that a 21 year old, 22 year old coming out of um, university is a finished product, but the educational institutions can give them the skills to go and acquire the knowledge um, that's needed. Um, addressing the Generation um, uh, Z point that's been made, um, I found Generation Z to be incredibly dedicated and hardworking. In fact, they're very, very um, how can I put it? Very almost zealous to acquire um, academic knowledge. The problem is that often trying to acquire that knowledge just to pass tests, just to get the qualifications, because they see that as a way of advancement. And what um, we're trying to do at uh, Greenwich and in partnership with uh, the IBT in Sri Lanka is to direct some of that uh, zealousness to acquire the knowledge, to acquiring the skills that they need as well, the research skills. And so they often find them, they're too focused on results rather than the actual learning process and acquiring these transferable skills that can go um, into almost any job. Um, Thank, you, also, Justin. Oh, Thank you, Professor Justin. Thank you, Professor Justin. For the interest of time, I'll have to move on. Um, next question is to Sujiva. Vocational Training Institute's mission is to build globally skilled, employable youth. What are your thoughts on our Vocational Training Institutes and their delivery? A two to three minute answer, please. I know. Thank you. Thanks, Chandi. I hope you can you can hear me. And yes, uh, well. thanks, Dinesh and ICC team. I think this is a very very interesting topic. And uh, I think uh, just uh, I think since I'm given only two minutes, I have to rush uh, quickly. And Sri Lanka Tertiary and I think Vocational Training Commission, it says that there are report there are about 400 institutions, uh, you know, uh, in either public, private, or NGOs. I think that's very such a large amount of uh, institutions. But monitoring process is there, but unfortunately for the you know for some reason quality of programs always varied, uh, uh, you know, or rather depend on the institutions, which is uh, not we should not be the case. And looking at from employers, particularly uh, private sector, they feel that the quality of the, uh, you know, the education system in the vocational uh, institutions, especially, do not meet the actual needs up to now, which, which is a, which should be a greater concern. But why are we having it? But the reasons being, the students who seek employment in the, especially in the private sector, not adequately exposed to private sector culture. That's one of the reasons, and also they are lack. In, uh, especially in business sense. And uh, also, you know, some of the vocational positions need to be uh, rebranded with uh, different connotations. I can, I, I can tell you in, a, in a Sri Lankan languages, you know, some uh, now carpenter, if you take mason, if you take uh, even electrician, you know, they still, they continue last so many decades or the, uh, you know, the hundreds of years, you know, they continue to have the same kind of uh, designation. Why can't we change? Obviously, they are also professionals, but uh, this is something which we have to extremely careful. Now, say certain things like, you know, waiter, we have changed it to steward sometime. You know, the barber, okay, hairdresser. Uh, why can't we come out with a fancy kind of, uh, you know, the designations uh, is, is, is something that we need to look at. And also vocational training institutes need to be uh, developed and professional institutes 
to give more recognition sometimes which is not there there are enough uh, mushroom kind of institutions which uh, which is also important for us to understand education our system is mainly chand is uh, you know the teacher sorry uh, yeah teacher center it's not student center so that is also another important thing because teacher is basically working very hard and students are compared uh, becoming a passive uh, kind of uh, you know the active listener so which is uh, which is important because that has to be changed another uh, the, uh, point is about the different skill sets i mean they are having uh, you know now uh, in fact couple of speakers spoke about hard skills and soft skills in other words or the technical skills i consider those as hard skills but our people are lacking soft skills which is very very important you know some of the uh, some of the soft skills are see creativity and critical thinking collaboration and communication which is very very important which is not there and flexibility stress management and these kind of spiritual even aspects so leadership and teamwork i think those also will have to be inculcated which is lacking in some of our people as a result chandi what happens is you know sri lankan people are not employable kind of you know there are no demand but the government i think professor lakshman uh, was talking about something government has anyway launched a program to make employable skill workforce i think that has been done unfortunately uh, the name is skill uh, sri lankans but because of this covid i think there had been certain issues if not i think by now we would have had fairly large number of uh, you know the skill workers getting into the uh, market either local or global thanks chandi i hope that i have done it thank within you. my given time great thank you um isro kripadana isro given the unpredictable dynamic environment in the banking sector how do you future proof the workforce to deal with ambiguity and crisis at commercial bank you are speaking on mute isro uh, thanks for the invitation uh, and uh, particular question uh, i think the bank king industry is going through a lot of changes particularly uh, because of the move from uh, retail banking to digital banking uh, we have a urgent uh, challenge to uh, upskill the workforce and shift some of them to uh, more digital areas in the future because uh, digital banking would be taking over most of the retail banking uh, task and uh, with that <coughs> you will find the demand for uh, different talents coming up in the industry uh so it's a, it's more about creating agile teams uh rather than the uh, the teams that structures we have and same time uh, creating a culture uh, uh, it's a old world but i think uh, learning organization because uh, we have to create a learning organization to adapt to this new situation and seek out the opportunities in that because uh, while we save staff on the retail banking side we will need more staff working on the risk area working on customer relation chief management and uh, digital infrastructures particular things like uh, robotic process automations rp engineers all these things would be new jobs and new opportunities coming so as professor watavala said we prefer to generally take uh, a level students and build them as bank as getting them to do professional banking exams and then to do other courses like cma or accountancy and some go to do the mbas also so we we grow our own team i mean we grow our own talent so talent development and talent uh, shift uh, to this uh, new areas would be the key challenge uh, we are facing and uh, i'm sure with, with that we have to change the learning infrastructure in the organization as well great thank you isro um praka next question is for you world economic forum's future of job survey shows that companies are restructuring their workforce in response to new technologies such as um, cloud computing big data analytics ai including ml nlp what kind of impact will this have on the workforce thank you janni and and you certainly have a very tough job uh, moderating a panel with 14 <laughs> people um uh, thank you for the invite and the august company tumbling to answer your question i'll keep it short uh, there are four major impacts that we see and as as we represent clients and we partner with clients there are four major themes that have emerged one is uh, what constitutes workforce so more and more employers today are not just uh, uh, kind of looking at uh, uh, the permanent workforce and the temporary workforce an uh, advent of new work called off balance worksheet um, or or off balance worksheet workforce has emerged where people and employers are extensively talking about external contributors they're talking about 
service providers. They're talking about tech force workforce automation and technology which is implemented because all of this is being tracked with respect to investment. All of this is being tracked with respect to productivity. The second change that has happened is if you were to think about it, and I think uh, Izuru touched upon the point that with things like robotic process automation, what you're doing is you're taking away tasks and, and you allow, you're allowing employers and managers to focus on outcomes. Now, with a focus on outcomes and as tasks and repeated activities are being taken out, employers are able to manage outcomes better and thus a direct impact on productivity. The third bit around cloud computing, because that's different from cognitive technologies like AI and ML, uh, cloud computing, there has been a large scale uh, uh, change primarily because of remote working. And what we see is that it has impacted the workplace itself. So how do you kind of uh, do uh, uh, in entire infrastructure creation around um, cybersecurity? How do you take care of stuff which is more around uh, cybersecurity? And the last point, and, and I can see a lot of HR professionals here, is around redesign of jobs and careers. And that's the most important point because, again, come to think of it, if, if we are taking out um, uh, if we are taking out repeated jobs and activities, what we are doing is we are creating opportunities to create super jobs. And these super jobs fundamentally will, will emerge at the back end and will allow employers to uh, image, to, to upskill themselves. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next question is to Roshan. Roshan, why is this tech skills and the future skills that we've been talking about is important? According to a McKinsey article, cognitive, social, and emotional skills like adaptability and resilience are also fundamental skills. And I think we heard that being repeated even in Sandeep's presentation earlier. Um, do you think we hire for these skills as well? And also, what do you think uh, we need to do in order to build these skills in our organizations? Thank you, Chandi. Uh, we certainly do, not only hiring, but for our existing talent who to build during their journey with us. So we use um, psychometric assessment in our talent strategy to determine an individual's suitability for a role based on the essential cognitive skills and, and the personality characteristics. So also it offers the um, crucial insight into a person's cognitive ability and reveals the underlying potential. We also use for creating insight for development plans for uh, individuals, especially on emotional and the social competencies. And we, we uh, spoke on this for a couple of speakers. So how do we set about helping these uh, individuals to make a behavioral change? We have found that um, coaching is an, quite an effective way for improving in the areas of EI gaps. Many of the organizations today use coaching and probably it's very effective as long as the person has the learning agility. Uh, this is where even the, the psychometric tools will come to play in your talent strategy execution phase, where it will provide insights on your self-management level. So at the designing stage um, on the talent strategy, uh, we use the team dynamics tools as well, which now has evolved in these uh, various techno savvy uh, assessments that we have. And, and basically it uncovers your team's collective strengths and blind spots. So, uh, in, in, in general, perceive, uh, in generally, we per perceive that EI is all about social, likability, compassion. But um, we sometimes use a different lens on people who ruffle the feathers and disrupt the status quo. Generally, uh, when you say EI, people sort of have a different uh, context on, on the person. But in an environment, in the new normal, how do we build hunger and the continuous improvement in a person, especially when the going gets tough uh, in today's context? So Mackenzie suggests resilience is the key and how do we build this? And, and you ask this question, you can have the best technological advance in a, in a car race, but without a good crew or a pit, and a pit crew, you're not going to win. So in my organization, uh, we have diverse professionals and we, even with tech advancements, the brick and mortar model still remains strong. Irene highlighted the skills and not degrees. Um, so it's very prevalent in, in, in our organization, like I represent, but without prejudice to helping them to develop the conceptual ability. We do have intervention to bring this aspect in our learning development interventions. So creating an environment 
to manage failures is one of the key success factors to build resilience, especially in this VUCA environment. Ultimately, everyone needs to collaborate, to be open to surprises, challenge the norm. But one should be comfortable in taking risks. And this is where um, senior leaders in our company, especially the chairman of the Hades and Sigur group, uh, allows us to not to be afraid to fail. So this is where the senior leaders then need to pull their socks. Thank you, Chandi. Thank you. Now we're going to shift it to the HR's role in this um, entire skill building and skill development. We're going to start off with Dr. Mahesha. The million dollar question, what are your expectations as a CEO um, from HR in the new normal? Thank you, Chandi. Again, it's all about people. So there are many expectations from HR. Um, I will group this into three broad areas in the interest of time. The first area is about business continuity. That's about understanding the evolving risks and taking actions to mitigate these risks. It's uh, extremely important for us to, in this context, take care of our people so that they can continue to perform and serve our customers. So the first area for me, the expectation is how do we uh, manage our business continuity? That's a big expectation. And connected with the first area, the second area is about uh, the driving, organize, driving the organization transformation. Already the organizations are in certain level of transformation and we need to drive this. It's about, drive, uh, about transforming the organization into a very agile, resilient, and certainly a productivity-driven one. In the, in the new norm, we need to make sure that we upskill people to operate on tech platforms, and we talked about in several of the previous speakers on this. So that is a very important area, how we can drive organizational transformation, that's the second area. The third area, and that's the most important area, is how do we get excellence in execution? We can have plans, but what finally matters is how well we execute. So execution and excellence, how do we get people to execute is another big area of uh, high expectation from HR to deliver with the teams. This is about getting the right people. And when I mean right people, people who can think outside the box, people who can think 10x, not incremental, think in terms of multiples of growth, multiples of uh, what we do, how to make big impacts. Getting the right people, then getting them into right seats inside a lean structure, that is very important. For us to be agile, we need to operate in lead structures. And then uh, not only getting into right seats, but people having the right capabilities to, to deliver the, the results. And when it comes to capabilities, we can generally talk about the knowledge, skills, and attitudes. But on top of it, we need to be able to get the capabilities right for people to collaborate, work in cross-functional teams, and also put the team success in front more than the individual success. So in short, these are my three big expectations from HR in the new normal. Okay, thank you. Mahesh, next question is to you. In your view, is HR having a positive impact on organization's growth, profitability, and innovation? How is the HR profession responding to this? Uh, Chandiv, I think uh, it depends. It depends on two, two factors. Uh, firstly, it's the strategy of the organization, how dependent that uh, on people. Uh, you might say every organization uh, will depend on people, but uh, the, the magnitude of that dependency can vary. And uh, uh, if I'm to uh, just give an example now, if I take my organization 20 years ago, we were a broken organization. Uh, we had only a bunch of people, uh, but still they wanted to make a change. And uh, so in, in the in the process, we had only our people. 
and uh, i hope i am clear uh, chandi yes uh, so bunch of people and uh, so where we are today is entirely a people uh, people centered strategy and uh, so in that process we have coined uh, our own authentic phrases like uh, extraordinary results to ordinary people uh, strategy bets on people uh, we are built on human emotions passion and spirit we call it our eps and like we build people and people build our business so so we are highly highly in fact you know it's a make or break thing for us and i i read recently somebody writing uh, saying that his organization only hire phd's uh, poor hungry determined uh, so you know that that denotes the entire strategy of the organization with people so i when i clarified when dinesh invited me for this uh, webinar when i clarified something from him he has quoted the professor ulrich saying hr uh, is not about hr hr is uh, hr begins and ends with uh, business so i think that captures everything that captures everything so i think it depends on the ability to hr to see that invisible intangible space where it generate tremendous energy uh, power the steam for organization to resist i'm mean, especially in the context of i mean we don't know what is stored in for us next next week uh, but it is a people who will rally around the organization and we don't know the response that you know we can't articulate a response now a standard response it will depend on the challenge the gravity of the disruption uh, so I, i think you know hr is is, is absolutely it's it's the make or break of the organization definitely absolutely but for that to happen hr should have that ability to see through rather than generic application of hr fundamentals but to see that authentic requirement of the organization and to help organization to navigate and grow and you know in a way everything thank you thank you next question is to isuru gunasekhara isuru um, so far we've been talking about the importance of tech skills in our workforce in your opinion when you look at it from an hr perspective what is the role of technology in hr and um, i'd like to hear about your journey in skill enhancement in the hr teams as well thanks sunday hi good evening everyone it's a pleasure to be connected uh, so firstly i think it's important to understand that every business uh, must determine the most suitable level of technology that is required for it um it shouldn't be over engineered uh, nor under engineered it should be in that right zone uh, mr chaudhry you know clearly articulated this in his keynote that technology will increase its importance in the shara stand goes by um and although we must not lose sight of the criticality of the human touch points and connections we need tech uh, to manage a sheer scale of business requirements productivity and and speed to strategy and decision making so we have moved away now from simple time and attendance systems to having systems that understand individual employee behavior uh, through ai and machine learning uh, where the system guided responses are customized to each employee and with the ever decreasing employment life cycles um quickly learning and responding to user behavior is becoming more and more important so if you just think about the current environment um, and how would we have ever been able to manage uh, our human capital life cycles without robust technology right i mean we are living right in it so while maybe not to these current levels uh, but it's very likely that a hybrid work model is most likely here to stay Uh, in in the long in the long term in some shape or form so whether it be recruitment performance management employee engagement or the delivery of learning and development tech is going to be that key differentiating factor between playing catch up uh, with business requirements or making it a competitive advantage but at the same time i think it's very important to also be mindful of the pitfalls tech is expensive Uh, so it should be you know horses for courses uh, it should be picked at the right level otherwise it will really drag the business down uh, low level of adoption is going to be another challenge so functionality must be practical with buying from the users uh, we should not let it be a, an information cemetery uh, security of data information is critical and it's costly to safeguard but it is must and on the other hand you spoke about skills so with the increase in tech comes a need to continuously upskill our employees as 
as well, not only in our HR teams, but overall. So we are increasingly looking for employees who have a high tech quotient, and we spoke about soft skills earlier and that ability to continuously learn and adapt. So a data-driven tech appreciative mindset is a must, and we have something that we constantly focus on. That because the tech skills that you join a company with is going to be obsolete in a year, um, and if you don't keep up with it, you're going to be you know, left behind. So if you don't keep upskilling employees as you keep up with the trend, you run the risk of isolating employees um, into feeling you know, a loss in connection and that human touch point, and then they look at HR as something quite, uh, quite, quite, quite uh, you know, disconnected. So adoption goes hand in hand with the tech quotient. Uh, so it is critical to be mindful of this. So in a nutshell, Chandi, you know, it's tech plays an absolutely critical role in HR and it's a must have, not a nice to have anymore. Uh, and it can be your key differentiator. So we need to use it well, uh, but we also need to use it wisely uh, and keep be mindful of the things that can go wrong as well. Thank you. Great, thank you. Next question is to Surani. Surani, post COVID, uh, employees literally left the building. How can HR still ensure we engage and maintain the organization culture remotely? Thanks, Chandi. Um, let me address the culture piece first. Um, first and foremost, I think the culture uh, is the overall behavior of the organization. And for me, culture is driven by the behaviors of the leaders. Now, especially in this COVID context, with more and more people working from home, the culture will need to be built or continuously emphasized by all levels of our people. So whether it is the line supervising the manufacturing uh, uh, the factory, whether it is the accounts executive, whether it, it is uh, the doorman. So at all levels, culture will need to be built and the behavior therefore is very, very vital. From an HR point of view, it is to ensure that that is monitored and actually emphasized. But like I said, culture has to be driven by uh, people and preferably by the management. As for the engagement, there are three things that I would like to share with you all today. These three things is something that has worked for me uh, during the past one and a half years. Um, first and foremost is, um, is recognition, uh, celebration. Uh, yes, we are all uh, working out of homes um, and we may not see each other as often as we would have liked to, but there's nothing stopping us from actually celebrating the smaller successes, uh, rewarding and recognizing those successes. And even in some cases, it could be behaviors and even the commitment given by our employees during such a difficult period. Um, the second one is very cliche, but it's communicate, communicate, communicate. Um, regular communication is vital uh, and openly. It has to be, um, we have to be honest with our people because people are scared. People are worried about uh, jobs um, and their well-being and therefore honesty is vital. Um, third for me, I think is uh, taking a much more supportive stance, um, whether it is um, getting people ready to work from home, whether it is to understand what the, the difficulties people are facing and current context, the last couple of months has also meant more and more of our people had their, staff, their families getting impacted with COVID. And therefore that caring supportive stance has been vital. So for me, three main things, communicate, reward, recognize, celebrate, and of course, a much more supportive and caring stance. Thanks, Chandi. Thank you. So we have our first round last question going to Mr. Amaduli. Please share some HR best practices that you implemented at JSK, uh, GSK during COVID. Well, my name starts with A and I thought I'll be the first, but <laughs> better to be the last, right? So <laughs> thank you, Dinesh, and thank you, ICC, for inviting me. Pleasure to be with, reconnecting with ICC again after, after a while, yeah. Uh, great to see some familiar faces as well. And uh, Chandi, well conducted so far. Okay. <laughs> well, I no longer work for GSK, but I'll tell you about... Um, 
pharmaceutical industry as such because i do a lot of most, most of my clients are pharma companies so some of the practices best practices which is going on now during the covid time is um, some learnings which probably you know some of you can pass on to your uh, people from the sri lankan com pharma companies as well uh, firstly one thing uh, as sandeep said say it is offering a level playing field for everybody okay the covid one thing that has dramatically done to every organization is that we are all in the same level playing field yeah uh, same same kind of businesses same kind of opportunities so those who are able to find innovation and doing things differently have been quite successful others will lag behind so it's one one good thing that has happened yeah so what did pharma some of these pharma companies do uh as you know a medical rep is the main job of the uh, in the pharma industry that yes they have to go and meet the doctors they have got to visit the hospitals meet them and um, and the doctors just refused to meet them because of the covid situation so they were compelled therefore to stay at home yeah at the same time as you know the pharma companies look at the number of calls these medical reps make to the doctors yeah uh uh that is their performance for for the day and for based on that they generate the sales so uh they were not doing that yet they had to make sure sales happen and as probably all of you must have read i am sure same thing happened in sri lanka as much as in india pharma was one of those you know industries which was growing very well during the covid time continues to grow well okay primarily i suppose because especially for the covid related products so they resorted to digital marketing yeah i think all companies started training them digitally sending you know how do you make a presentations on the on your tablet or even on your phone smartphones but then you know doctors are busy and therefore they don't like to be disturbed every now and then so therefore what did they do they had to find out what is a good time for the doctors they would go to the doctors you know houses meet them in the basement of the apartments so that's how they they, they were able to uh, make this uh, make the doctor call so that was one of the things that they did let since gsk is my earlier company i particularly was watching them but they did a lot of training too as you know medical reps have to be trained their skill set of detailing about product knowledge has to be improved by training which used to have be in the classrooms yeah so they resorted you know, instead of that through using digital means to train them which was part of the thing you know part of their work that they had to spend so many hours digitally because they did not want to obviously lay them off so none of the pharma companies laid off people but they did extensive training and this marketing and they succeeded so that was something that was very well done pharma companies as you know they were allowed to work during covid times even the head office being a health healthcare industry they were exempted so you know keeping the covid protocols and things like that uh they did happen so this uh, some of the practices that the pharma companies did during the covid time everybody is talking about a hybrid model which is bound to happen is everybody's expectations and therefore i think that hr will have to find a newer you know innovative ways of managing this hybrid employees how do you measure the perform people who work from home how do you measure earn compensate do you want to have any compensation differentials especially for companies where they have some people working from home some work from from the office so these are the challenges as my predecessor previous speaker said you know how do you engage them how do you build a culture how do you bring them together you need to ways and uh, means should be found to engage them and bring them together which will be a big challenge at the same time today's economic times in in the in the, the front page of economic times in india in bangalore which are read you know goldman sachs for example they are giving now started giving free breakfast and free enticing employees to come to work instead of staying at home because they believe that more productivity is you know achieved 
if they are at the office. So if you want, I can send a newspaper cutting to Dinesh who can circulate it. Uh, they believe that much more productivity is better when they are in the office and they are enticing the employees by free lunches and free breakfast and things like that. Yeah. Um, at the same time, I also read somewhere in the front page of Times of India last week, which said so one, one BPO company with 60,000 employees is planning to inst install cameras at the workplace where the employees are working at home. So I think you get a different kinds of uh, reporting. I don't know. How. Personally, I have not experienced these things. So we are all guessing what the future is going to be. Yes, everybody is thinking that hybrid model will be the model for the future. Yeah, I think uh, uh, the context setting speaker, Sandeep, laid it very clearly that yes, uh, and skills will be more important than degrees, as some other speaker did. So these are the changes that I see. Okay, I think for the want of time, I think I'll conclude. So this is my view and my experience in the pharmaceutical industry. Again, good good evening. Lovely to meet all of you again. And greetings from Cornucopia again to you. Great, thank you, um, Arun. Shall I go for a few more questions? Thanks. Thanks very much, Chandi. That's our first round done. Uh, and uh, we have been receiving some queries, questions from the audience that are joined with us uh, via the Facebook platforms. So Dinesh Virakodi, the incumbent uh, chairman of ICC Sri Lanka, is poised and ready to take some uh, of those questions, plus some others as well that he has in mind to ask our panel. So. We invite Dinesh now to take over. Thanks, Chandi. Thank you. Thank you, Arun. Thank you, Chandi. Uh, good evening to all. Uh, uh, we have got about 10 to 15 questions. I picked up five interesting questions. I'll start off with uh, Lakshman. If, are you there, still there? Yeah, yeah. I'm Prof, here, are you yeah. still there? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. This, this is a very interesting question. It says, all governments have given lip, lip service to education reform. What is your formula to change this? <laughs> Yeah, actually, I must tell you that currently it is really in the technological area that we have to do the change, you know. And uh, if you look at India, as I told you, the All India Council for Technical Education, they have a separate council. Now, today we have a technological ministry. So what I would suggest is under that ministry, you set up this uh, technological council and let them set up uh, uh, universities and also connected to that will come the colleges. So then maybe uh, if you say 200 uh, institutes, all the private sector will come and they will educate. Then there'll be a really a growth in the industry. So that's what will happen. Then in addition to that, we can have maybe uh, business, uh, accounting, various uh, professional institutes that can come in. And the other thing, of course, is the professional institutes. Now, I don't know what the computer society is doing, you know, because when a professional body finds that the people required are the IT people, now, from our side, we produce the accountants, either chartered accountants, management accountants, or accounting technicians. Then they must come up. I have already told them that there are 20,000 vacancies. Please come up and do this. So actually, the private sector has to take the lead. Otherwise, nothing will move. And we are, we are more flexible than the government. You know, government is very, very difficult to change things. So if we are having a college, now affiliated colleges, that's how India has done it. Of course, we maintain the quality. We are able to give the service. So I feel definitely uh, that uh, a change has to be done. And uh, certainly, uh, it will really change the whole picture. You know, we are all talking of knowledge hub. No? If the port city comes, do you think that we have any qualified people who can go and work in the port city? <coughs> no, because universities are not doing it. So definitely, yeah. so, Prof, I'll, park, park, park this, I'll park this here. You know, you have been a president of a chamber. I'm a president of a chamber. Have we done enough uh, in building up this talent pool? Because we are always blaming the government. But have we done enough from the private sector? Yeah, no, that's what I say. The private sector is always good for various uh, uh, demands and saying. But now they must come with the solutions. You see the chambers of commerce. They have very, very powerful people. No, So they must tell the government, don't worry, we will support you. We don't want money. That is what we must say. The government has no money to set up universities. No, but if we set up one 
government sector university which can set up uh, colleges then the whole problem is sorted no then all the private sector will run and do this so i think if they are able to give these suggestions uh, we can make it a really a great success thank you uh, dorkanath maybe you can comment uh, i think you heard the conversation yeah uh, yeah Yeah, Dinesh, I totally agree with what Professor Lakshman has said. I think you know, still India is just introduced the skills program in 2016, and as you know, in 2020 they created a national education policy, which is totally revamped. The whole idea is to bring a transformative vision, so that you know it's bound to impact the grassroots and micro narratives that radically change. i think unless you start from the grassroots that's where the education policy is put you can't just do skills development without creating a proper education policy where government has to support these to do it but it is in the hands of the private sector who can play a crucial role i just give you without naming those institutions i name it for instance in housing when you said the skills development requires in infrastructure construction where there is a lot of growth is happening in india projects and so on they said many companies conglomerates india is said we will absorb them we will give them experiential learning we give them apprenticeships you know everything is not what you see in the blueprint dinesh i think it needs to go beyond that and you need to adopt somebody said adaptability and flexibility you may have broad framework and guidelines but i go one step further since two of you are sitting here the stalwarts of the chamber of commerce of sri lanka maybe you know you need to seek government to create some hubs and sector council where some empowerment to be given to the chambers with a proper framework and 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 governance to give the authority for instance at the cost of repression all india management association has given to this mbpc to authenticate and certify skills program it is not just to obtain a degree it is to earn livelihood and also to relearn learn and develop the skills uh, now dorka uh, for example it is said it's much more difficult to get into an iit than get into harvard or mit how yeah. how can sri lanka create uh, replicate an iit here i know it's a difficult uh, question but uh, it's it's a great question dinesh i think you know knowing sri lanka so well thanks to you i have been very for us i mean what i have seen the quality i think it's not important but this has to start from the tone at the top tone at the top is important and somebody said walk the talk it is no point in creating you know i just want to say even admission cannot get you may be a very top guys son or a nephew that has been said it many many years ago i don't want to quote it has been told very clearly sorry if you want go to mit or harvard but don't come to iit delhi it's been quoted so i think that is you have to tone at the top you can't do because uh, then you know what what happens is you can't in standard if once you say iit it means iit that's important thank you uh, prof there is another question for you maybe ravi also can also respond to this uh somebody saying that we actually developed first world class talent in the past and somebody wants to know where we went wrong yeah really uh, of course where we went wrong i don't know huh? we have been going wrong right from the beginning because if you really see everything but uh, it is really that uh, you know the delivery side you know if you look at the uh, universities i think uh, as i said earlier now Uh, after you finish schooling at the correct age you know so 18 or 19 you wait one and a half years by the time you qualify you become a doctor at 26 27 some of them are married dolls so there is something wrong you know because if the government doesn't put the pressure and do this uh, it will never happen you know so what i say is uh, also the quality you know now the arts graduates they should have seen because i remember maybe long time ago they had the Uh, the race course and they opened it as the horse faculty you know where they put all the arts graduates there but then they must they should train them because actually there is no accountability what i will say is that all the vice chancellors should be accountable to the products that they are producing not that they should come to the ugc and protest if the vice chancellor and the professors and others are taken to task there won't be any problem government must know to make them accountable so i think this accountability is the most important thing and if you do that 
right from the top, everyone will be responsible and uh, give the results. Thank you. Uh, Ravi, anything from you? Ravi just had Ravi? to log off. He uh, Ravi logged off, Dinesh. He had to go for yeah. another urgent meeting starting at 6. Okay. Okay. Uh, Mahesh, there's a question for you. you uh, uh, Mahesh, you talked about the importance of HR, but still very few people get, uh, get into the boardroom from the HR uh, vertical. Any reason for that? Um, there's no clear answer for that. I, I, I don't have an intimate answer, but I, I would say that uh, HR profession, profession itself must uh, gain that recognition at the board level. Uh, so, uh, uh, I don't know, we, we have a, uh, a, a prophecy in HR on our board. Uh, uh, so, uh, we, we also, previously also we had a HR professor on our board. Um, Dinesh, uh, uh, I, I, I think it's the value that, uh, value that uh, HR creates, uh, the impact, the, the uh, gaining that recognition itself will create that space, I, I would suggest. Okay, can we get a quick response from uh, Dwarkanath and Ahmed Dwarka was chairman of a company? Uh, okay, very quick response. Uh, I think as long as you understand the business realities and you are organizationally savvy, I considered HR as also we are in the business of people, but you need to align your people practices to the business realities. Unfortunately, we do all this on our silos thinking this is the best practice. But the question is whether it's add value to the business. They've already said HR can occupy a center table when they see the, that the business feels that they can add value to the business. So aligning people practices to the business practices rather than doing for getting awards is something which is important. One, you understand the business. And secondly, if you have the strategic focus uh, and with a delivery, and the Professor Lakshman was saying about the accountability, HR has to take accountable for what they do. Training is not just for the sake of doing training. If you do these three things, uh, I would say in case of Dave Aldrich, the five competencies set strategy, focus, HR delivery, techie savvy, business knowledge, then you you, you can succeed. Uh, uh, you can become a chair or a board member. Uh, thank you, Dwarka. Uh, I'm sure Deloitte have done a lot of research. Maybe you can uh, uh, give us a quick point. Sure, Dinesh. I think, I think uh, yeah. uh, Mr. Dwarkanath has kind of summarized it well. But just to bring on to the point that if you look at any um, uh, service sector, almost 35 to 42% of the OPEX cost is compensation and employee cost. Now, for companies to have someone represent their brand, represent their people, and the fact that 45% of their operational expenditure, it's imperative. And, and most progressive companies have tend to do that. Uh, it's most thought leaders have spoken about it. So I don't think it's about individuals. Uh, while as individuals, some of the HR leaders may, may not have garnered their position, but generally uh, most companies, forward-looking companies, because of the sheer ROI on people investment and the brand value have given place to HR uh, on the board. Thank you. Uh, Ahmed Ali, can I, uh, uh, can I turn to you? This yes. uh, Sri Lanka is doing, putting a lot of effort to promote the pharma industry. But yeah. one of the biggest issues we have is that we don't have the skills. For example, to put up a, uh, to put up a vaccine plant, uh, we, are, we are struggling to find the right talent. Now you have worked for years and years in the pharma industry. How do we get this together? I think uh, I don't know the number of pharmacy colleges you have, but I think we also talked about you know especially vaccine plants and all. You don't. They require actually skilled people. You know, botanic skills, those kind of skills. So I think. Uh, Skills development is more important than uh, how uh, I'm not. If anybody can enlighten me of the number of pharmacy colleges, India has got tremendous number of. Uh, Bangalore itself has got about 120 pharmacy colleges. So I think you know uh, uh, that's a great opportunity, and you know the uh, number of pharmacy graduates which come out for these factories and also for medical reps jobs, product managers jobs. So that's I think. Uh, more and more of pharmacy colleges. And of course, for the lower end job, you know, in fact, uh, as Dwarka will know this, he's talked about these 37 sectors. Medical reps training is also part of these skills that the government of India is promoting. We get a subsidy 
for running a medical reps in you know a nas program it is called so if you have you know apprentices uh, of pharmacy colleges they get the government pays us so i think the government should also support uh, in in developing pharmacy uh, employees pharmacy resources that's how i think india has been able to become the pharmacy of the world as you know after the us the maximum number of pharmaceutical plants are in india and we produce the highest number of uh, you know unit drugs in the world so i think india has become very big yeah. champion of pharmacy yeah thank you thank you uh, sujeeva are you still there sujeeva yeah dinesh i am here yeah, yeah sujeeva uh, i have a question for you uh, i know you did a lot of great work when you were president of the institute of chartered accountants now for the last 5 yeah. years we have been complaining over our graduates how do yeah. we actually how can uh, the chambers and professional bodies like yours get together and actually make these guys employable which is you know now i was talking about the soft skills right we all have hard skills if you take me as a chartered accountant i know about my accounting standard auditing standard international financial reporting companies act scc act and all that we are very much conversant but the issue here is about your interpersonal and the soft skills that is not there with our people which is very 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 important you ask a question about you know how many of us get into uh, boards in this country that is because lack of that lack of uh, soft skills they are unable to articulate they are unable to answer they are unable to they always their mindset is enough you know the, the uh, framework that framework they never go out of the box they never th- think about they are the people very few people who get into uh, you know the boards people like you and i you know we are we are we are think we are thinking differently that is the, that those are the skill sets that all institutes including my own institute of chartered accountant should uh, seriously look at uh, dinesh okay uh, prof can, yes, I, can i can i help for that can yeah. i add on yeah. that one yeah, yeah no, prof actually ask you a question hmm. prof right, i'm going to ask you a question and then you can add on to that yeah. uh, the, this is a very interesting question given our talent pool what are the industries we should promote yeah uh, i'll just answer that earlier question yeah. you know today those who are in the universities they are doing the professional exams you know why because as i was said earlier by the others to get them into the business side you know because if they are our graduation is not really sufficient for them to get a job <clears throat> so with this uh, professional program they are able to get the uh, business uh, knowledge and how they can interact with business so this is uh, one area i think the key area that we have to be concentrate is on technology that's why i said now there is a technology ministry that is there so they are say 20000 jobs are there so that's what the private sector has said but then we must have a definite plan how we are going to do it you know because if they set up what i told you that what is successful in india where they have a university and that will be a government university you know they will give the certificate now supposing we say pune university pune university is giving the certificate then you have maybe 100 colleges or 200 colleges and some of them in the rural areas they will then give the education and the training uh, for these uh, people then when they pass out they will get this certificate not uh, from yeah. these various colleges it's from the main one so then it is uh, yeah. recognized that's what i'm saying okay thank you uh, mahesh can you respond to this question mahesh Yeah, yes, yeah, sure. Yeah, Mahesh, I know you have traveled the world, so I, I am sure you have. Lot of yeah, Mahesh. Mahesh, what are Dinesh, the are... what are the in- industries that we should uh, promote given ah. the talent pool we have? I think Mahesh, sir, you are. Yeah, yeah, Mahesh, yeah. yeah. Mahesh, are you? Okay, uh, maybe uh, I'll ask the other Mahesh to respond. Uh, no, I, I think Dinesh, we must give the opportunity. I, I, I don't see. I mean, always there's room to improve. Uh, I, I mean, it may be graduates, it may be any other uh, area, right? Uh, there's room to improve always, uh, enrich their uh, competencies and their skills and all that stuff. But I, I think we should give the give them the opportunity. Uh, if you give the opportunity, we have found. You know, we we have uh, uh, we have a program where recruit graduates. So we have over the last few years, we have recruited about 500 graduates. and even today we have about close to 300 graduates uh, we we recruit even uh, undergraduates uh, finally undergraduates so i i see there's lot of of course they all have their own aspirations 
some are some wants to you know expand their knowledge and you know very high aspirations and some i i don't understand you know because uh, now lot we, we feel very sad to lose people we train people uh, 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 people are you know getting now now uh, our graduates doesn't have to wait for very long you know when they apply for migration and all that right few months right uh, top talent uh, they are leaving so uh, i think there's nothing i mean i i think it's it's up to us to give them the opportunity mold them and and make a change uh, okay. of course of course absolutely there's room to room to improve I, I totally agree on that but i think we should start you know we should go to the mirror rather than go to the window in this uh, particular area okay uh, i have two final questions one is to the uh, hr experts in the private sector uh, there's a huge uh, talent uh, migration what can companies do to stem this can i start with kaushal yeah dinesh now when it comes to talent migration what we really need to look at is uh, why they are migrating because a lot in the the reality is the current companies were at times we are failing to failing to give them the required growth and again that growth is really connected to what sujeeva mentioned because they are not we, the companies really can't promote them and to give them that growth because they can't really perform at the elevated standards because they have the hard skill sets but the soft skills are not there so what we really need to do is adinesh in my thinking when we get these young graduates in we need to invest we need to focus we need to lay solid development plans not looking at the short term but to look at the long term now in my experience uh, uh, with british american tobacco as surani was there also what we look at is we take young graduates when we hire them today we are not looking at the next 3 years dinesh we are looking at 8 years 10 years down the line if we see them the spark the potential for them to be a functional director if we see them the spark of them going to a different opco and take leadership roles we take them we invest them we develop them i think that's the role of corporates we are to identify the potentials develop them and to export them thank you surani maybe Um, yeah. Okay. Today's mine is slightly different stance. I have. I think the biggest reason that we lose uh, top talent uh, out of out of Sri Lanka is actually they're looking at moving on because Sri Lanka as a whole is unable to give them the future that they are looking for. Um, they. Um, I. I feel they're still again. I, I a bit of what Kaushal mentioned is also there because they actually have to compete. in sri lanka with certain soft skills that they will not get access, soft skills as well as social backgrounds that may not get accepted um in in uh, certain levels and in certain companies or the so called norms um and therefore they feel they will have much better opportunities and but at the same time i mean take uh, engineering staff engineers uh, qualified science science chemistry graduates engineering graduates the opportunities for them in some of these countries it's huge and and i think for them they're looking at not only their own future but their family's future thank you uh, the two issues uh i would think that uh, one thing we have to change is uh, our compensation structures because uh, it's a more uh, skill based pay we should go for that's a major lacuna in our thing because we have to recognize that this is the grade not the grade or anything it's just the comp- uh, the skill the person brings to the table we have to pay for that uh, in the, if it is international class skill we should not hesitate to pay that the second thing is that some people want to migrate yes for family reasons for children education and all that but given the technology today they can still work for this company we should have that flexibility even from wherever they are uh, particularly this uh, 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 technological people they will be able to work for the uh, uh, same company so i think current some of the current employment practices and even some of the laws has to change to uh, accommodate these uh, situations particularly the compensation structures has to change to go towards skill based pay yeah uh roshan i will ask a different question from you this uh, now we are talking about uh, uh, the, the shortage of talent and etc etc can should we go and import in the short term 
at this current uh, uh, model that we are operating, Dinesh, uh, we like Isuru said, we don't really need to import. We actually now can do the gig, gig, the gig economy that we are having. Uh, we can hire people, but as, 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 as long as we pay the current remuneration. So actually, the the earlier uh, model of where multinationals used to sort of transfer people from geographies, today we don't need to actually move and it's a huge cost from one geography to another. So today we can hire, the, on, the, on the gig economy, we can hire people whom we want. As long as we manage the, uh, like what Isuru said, the manage the compensation structure as well as the incentive model. Thank you. Uh, Professor Justin, are you still on board? Yes. Yeah. This, uh, I'm sure you have been listening to this conversation about not producing the right kind of graduates for the industry. Yes. Uh, I know Greenwich uh, produces a lot of Sri Lankan, uh, uh, attracts a lot of Sri Lankan students also, right? Uh, what are some of your suggestions to, uh, to, to change this? Um, well, I mean, the problem is that um, producing graduates takes time. Producing quality graduates. Um, takes even more time. So if you're having a, an initial um, skill um, deficit, you know, a company has to um, import from, uh, graduates from somewhere. And I mean, what we see in, in the UK is actually a lot of virtual acting students coming over, particularly for um, master's level qualifications. And um, yeah, I think for a country to grow and an economy to grow naturally, what you have to do is start producing sufficient graduates in the sufficient numbers for the skills you need. I mean, this is uh, one of the things I'm actually trying to do um, in Sri Lanka. You know, we're partnering with uh, the college uh, there, and we're, you know, hopefully in September we'll be starting to produce, um, starting to train um, legal graduates and train them not just educationally, but in the soft skills they need, such as um, research skills. Uh, but will make them transferable for any to any job, you know, not just law. For instance, you know, anyone working in HR um, is work, you know, should be you know versed in the basics of um, you know, contract and employment law. And it's these sort of transferable skills that will help, okay. um, okay. um, you know, uh, ho hopefully fill um, the skill gap that uh, people have been complaining of, and it's so obvious that. Uh, People cry out for. Thank you, thank you. Uh, before, before I finish off this session, uh, the, I have a quick question for the Indian gentleman. Uh, every, everybody is interested to know how India managed to become the knowledge capital of the world, right? Can you summarize maybe in uh, in a minute what were the real uh, pillars that helped uh, India to build this? Uh, maybe Dwarkan actually go first. <laughs> okay, as you wish. Dinesh, great yeah. question. To summarize in one minute is difficult, but I'll do my best. I think, you know, yes, India is called the human capital hub, you know. I think a couple of things, I'm not saying there are many other countries which have done very well. I think one of the focus is on education based on a skill-based programs. I think, you know, that's the important the quality of education has increased considerably through technology now we are able to reach the villages. Still long way to go in a country like it. I am not giving a honky dory picture here. Everything is painted pink. It's not so. But we made that beginning. And secondly, as Professor Lakshman has said it in the beginning, we have institutionalized certain processes. I think if you want to succeed in education, Dinesh, you need to have institutionalized. You have AICT. You have UGC. You have many other hubs, National Skills Council, which has been created under the Prime Minister's uh, guidance. So these are all things makes empowerment. It is not a bureaucratic structure where it is controlled by Human Resources Ministry, but it's been empowered. I was in the board of the uh, Indian Institute of Management, Kashipur, but you know, and they started developing these institutions, maybe in Sri Lanka, uh, situation may be slightly different in the remote places in India where it's difficult to have an access, but through digitalization they can do. So to sum it up, it is, it is understanding the context and situation of your country 
and what is best may not hold good to you it may be different but india could do it well because they they spread this message a brilliantly and people are responding last but not the least there is a challenge on digital divide everybody is cannot afford to have these devices this is where government is promoting now how to make these digital devices accessible to the employees of the low economy and socially and education backward sectors thank you uh, ahmed i endorse what dwarka said i think you know uh, education has also become a, i would say like an industry i think people people are making money a lot of uh, private institutions started mushrooming for example you know you go to cochin you know you all of you have heard of cochin i am on the board of a cochin management college there there are three college uh, management colleges in a radius of just 2 kilometers right and they are all doing well i think um, of course the it boom it boom especially in bangalore hyderabad has also you know for the southern part of india um, made everybody go into engineering college every they saw that just working for an it company you can really become a, and people like narayan murthy and all have become uh, you know symbols of how people can become wealthy without any ancestral wealthiness right so i think all that motivated people to do more and more education you know during my time the nesh if i had to get into an engineering college either i must be brilliant or you know i had to pay high donation right one of the two which neither of two I, my father could afford neither was a brilliant student but today there are a lot of vacant seats there are so many engineering college in and around bangalore itself so i think the number of uh, colleges that has come up over the last yet as dwarka said you go to the re remote places of india still there are a lot of you know lack of education uh, you know a lot of uh, poor people who can't even afford education but the mushrooming of uh, colleges in the major cities and uh, smaller cities has really boomed education in thank india that, that has been thank you uh, yeah can we have the deloitte uh, gentleman also commenting So, uh, uh, Mr. Dinesh, uh, nothing much to add. I think Mr. Dwarka has kind of covered it all. I think the only thing which is from an in, from a Sri Lanka context, if I were to think about it, we reinvented our model of hub and spoke education by the sheer political will around 90s, and people tend to talk about the reforms that the then P. V. Narasimha Rao government brought in, uh, and we took about 10 years to reap the benefits. 1990, 1992 is when the privatization of education started. It was not until 2000, early 2000s. that the economic gdp started migrating towards service sector so it took time but we kind of uh, recalibrated a lot of what was invested and done for education and now if you look at india india is taking the education hub to tier 2 and tier 3 cities so bombay bangalore bombay continues to provide for the talent but the talent hub is now moving to tier 2 and tier 3 cities because again 5 years 10 years back government started opening education institutes premier ones in these locations right thank you uh, i will close with this very interesting question it is for uh, lakshman uh, uh, mahesh and sujeeva uh, the question reads so much of talk of about a public about public private sector partnerships why is this not working so mahesh can i start with you so uh, i would say dinesh let's not uh, uh, talk why we why is not starting rather than you know uh, uh, more value adding would be how we could start it right so uh, i think it? you know yeah, yeah i i think yeah. uh, connecting now we have a lot of uh, lot, i mean huge uh, university uh, community is there so uh, starting point i would say to start with uh, professor also uh, suggested uh, ugc and uh, some uh, some sort of partnership with the private sector so i would i would say a close collaboration between the universities and the private sector would be the starting i i think it's already there but to yeah. to take it to a different level so i i, th I think that would give us a uh, uh, initial uh, starting point to make it happen to make it quicker uh, to make it happen great point great point uh, sujeeva 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 rajapaksa please. yeah dinesh yeah yeah, yeah i'm am yes hey. yeah it's interesting uh, well, uh, uh, but uh, i'm yeah. sorry i'm uh, you know a yeah. little uh, unneeds to accept that it's not working but yeah. it's working right so there are quite a lot of uh, ppp projects happening here in sri lanka but unfortunately those are sometime at a very very large scale where you don't need so much of people 
but even uh, within next one or two years as you are aware according to the last uh, budget proposal there is going to be five techno parks where you know the you know the uh, public sector state owned enterprises are going to invest uh, and then obviously you know government is in the process of inviting world class you know the software players to sri lanka so that itself is uh, you know is about 12500 seats altogether likewise you know there are quite a lot of projects but i don't uh, agree if you say that it's not happening it's happening but maybe because of various reasons is ra rather slow Thanks. public perception sujeev a public that's perception. a public service i understand, I understand. Okay. <laughs> yes yes so, you are right prof everybody refer to you uh, refer yeah. to your, uh, your your presentation <laughs> so you can have the last word yeah I, i must tell you the basic problem is this you know government wants to give everything free you see this this cannot be done you, if you give free you give 35000 or 40000 places but if you make it affordable what i am saying is affordable people can afford it you get a loan from the bank uh, you pay it after you qualify once you get the job so government must work this out if they think of free education will be really in this rut you know ask our indian friends uh, their education is not free all the colleges you go you pay but make it affordable you don't have to pay the same cost you are paying for the foreign courses it will be one tenth or maybe a very small fraction of it and everyone can afford it so if this mentality is changed i think that's why i say don't go to the ugc set up this new one under the ministry of uh, uh, technology for engineering graduates and technological graduates and let them like the aict of india let them set up a government university which will have colleges around the country and this problem will be sorted out they'll give affordable uh, uh, degrees which will be there for the people to make it uh, really because i must tell on foreign direct investment today what have we got to offer if we have skilled people just as our indian friends how are they doing this uh, outsourcing that is because of the technical they have uh, the graduates uh, who are technically qualified the engineering graduates so all these people are talking of getting foreign investment that is not necessary educate our people give them the skills foreign exchange will automatically come right on that positive note i close this and hand it over to arun uh, thank you very much gentlemen and ladies thank you very much so that was a very wide ranging discussion that we had and we covered a lot of ground and obviously this is something that needs to be taken up policy will have to be designed and taken forward now we've heard just now in these concluding remarks uh, there were ideas that came forward and now the idea must see the light of day in a manner of speaking and to tell the cat well that is something that needs to be um, perhaps seen in the fullness of time we perhaps cannot wait until the solution or the 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 pandemic is fully dealt with maybe that would be too late so even now would be the time when those who are the policy makers will need to uh, be taking a fine focus on all of these areas so some of the key takeaway points that we were able to discern from the many thoughts and ideas that were brought forward um well obviously skill comes into fine focus so we have qualifications but skills are lacking and those skills move into different areas including what are known as soft skills and i think the lament was heard that people who are being qualified and sometimes coming out of the universities are just not ready to enter the world of of and certainly the future is what we need to look at the pandemic in itself has elevated the technological advantage to a position that it now enjoys without which all of this matter of working at home etc would not have been possible so obviously certain things have come uh, forward and have been made possible and now would be the time to leverage on those advantages that have accrued very much on account of the crises that have uh, emerged as a result of the pandemic and uh, we've heard the term that there are plenty of people but not the right people. so that's another reason for us to appreciate that there is a need for skills development centers to uh, be set up and uh, uh, continue to work 
uh, with recognition of the emerging situations. Now, didn't we hear quite a lot of uh, emphasis laid on the need for the private sector to come in, that it is not possible to depend on the government to provide all that is needed. It was also just that, you know, then uh, we've also come to appreciate that there are certain business models that have done better than and this period has shown what those advantages are, or rather, should I say, uh, which are the business models at the greater success. So the policymakers need to take a look at that and try to figure out what industries, what businesses, what enterprises can be brought to bear or set up consider talent pool that does exist. And then there will be the need to fine tune the talent that does exist or the existing skills to be upskilled or you know to do better. So those are some of the key takeaway points that we were able to appreciate uh, from the many that were covered. And I'd like to say thank you very much to all of our panelists and speakers who covered so much ground. And uh, thank you very much, we say, to Chandi Dhamaratna, who is the Vice President for HR with Virtusa, as well as the Head of Global HR Automation. Thank you, Chandi, for your contribution. And certainly thanks also to the Chairman of ICC Sri Lanka, Dinesh Virakkuri. And we are grateful for our many sponsors who have made this event possible. After we have had the final word uh, spoken, uh, to conclude matters with some words of thanks. Once that is done, then we would like to invite you to remain and view the sponsor videos. But now I hand over to Anjana Kulasekra, representing one of our sponsors, and that's Career Me. So, Anjana, over to you. Thank you, Arun. Um, I think you uh, highlighted the key points of our webinar very well. And it was a great learning for all of us, a very thought-provoking, a very timely topic, I think. And um, so I want to say a, a very uh, a strong thank you for all our keynote speakers. We had Professor Lakshman Watawala, Sandeep Chowdhury, Irene Teng, uh, for sharing your wealth of knowledge. And certainly our panelists from all over the world for tackling this uh, timely topic on education, skills, HR in this new normal. And um, certainly our moderators and of course our event partners for today, uh, which is ICC Sri Lanka for hosting, Institute of Chartered Accountants Sri Lanka, Great Place to Work, Cornucopia, Job Enrich, PIBT, Edge Zenit, Learn TV, Career Me, and our media partners, Daily Mirror and Daily FT. Um, thank you for our event partners and of course for all of the participants who joined in today to make this event a success. Thank you one and all and as Arun mentioned we will wrap up with some videos from our sponsors. Have a pleasant evening. Yeah, well, thank you very much. We will focus on the right now, but I would like to mention that this will remain with uh, the, those Facebook pages for uh, you know the, the, the various platforms: ICC, SL, Daily FT, uh, the Institute of Chartered Accountants, uh, Career Me. The Facebook page will continue to host or have this program, this entirety of the webinar uh, remaining on uh, so that in case you have missed some or you need to go over what was covered, you will be able to do that. Okay, that's it for now and take care and all the very best we say to all, please watch our videos. We are fast moving, crave innovation and in the era of digital disruption, no longer is there room for gut feelings and intuition. Gauging the future, knowing it's going to be right, there's a need to simulate the environment and know the what ifs.
It's the D3M we are looking at. Data-driven decision making. We have heard big data and business intelligence, but why not combine it with your greatest asset, your people? The next gen does not wait. We need things on the go. We reach all engagement avenues and language is a barrier no more. As we witness the silver tsunami and say hello to the gig economy, it's not fiction to have dashboards that show your stats right in front of you. For those millennial CEOs, it's time that you know who are your top performers, who is at the risk of leaving, the answers to all your what's, who's and why's. We access to data and information at our fingertips and don't have time for the monotonous. From mobile apps, kiosks, chatbots and enterprise social networks, everything is easy and clicked on the go. We grew with IoT and RFID simply redefined tracking and access. Why take our word when we can talk numbers? Predictive analytics gives you over 85% accuracy in your future decisions. Presentations and personalizations as we mold indigenous multinationals. Allowing you to feel the pulse of your organization, we bring to you People's HR Neon, the spark to your HR disruption. The International Chamber of Commerce Sri Lanka is the national office of the Paris-based business organization. The ICC comprises of membership of 45 million members in 130 countries. Trade facilitation, export and import and cross-border trade and issues relating to freight forwarding and many other matters of importance are addressed by the ICC. ICC Sri Lanka works through several committees to debate, discuss and suggest solutions on subjects related to the mandate of the Chamber. Missions are led by professionals in the committee, with many committees functioning. ICC includes a membership committee, International Relations Committee, Policy and Advocacy Committee, Training and Development Committee, Banking Committee. ICC is the sole authorized guaranteeing agency for a tier car. It's an internationally accepted customs document which enables duty-free and tax-free temporary importation of items as commercial samples. The Atiya Karnit reduces costs and red tape. The ICC is also known for its popular publications invaluable for bankers, lawyers, arbitrators and anyone involved in cross-border trade. Its members are provided with a member's privilege card which includes discounts with multiple retailers. ICC Sri Lanka's vision is to be the organization of choice to advance international trade and investment for businesses in Sri Lanka. ICC Sri Lanka's mission is to be the change agent in national policy formulation and implementation and facilitator of global businesses with Sri Lanka and disseminator of information on the development of business utilizing the services of ICC Paris while continuing to be a facilitator of dispute resolution. In addition, the ICC Sri Lanka organizes seminars, lectures, meetings with business leaders, and gives recognition to Sri Lankan businesses for outstanding achievements. ICC can play a special role in connecting business to the world and be a driving force for all Sri Lankan businesses. Job Enrich Private Limited, a renowned HR solutions provider in Sri Lanka, established in 2012, enjoys stature as a leader in human resources and talent management. And we have some of the finest international companies and global players in the market working with us. Having acquired deep insights into multiple industries, we offer a choice of candidates who best fill the needs of our clients, who we serve in providing human resources, trained, skilled, and empowered to deal with a constantly challenging environment, and able to lead organizations to achieve their entrepreneurial vision. Job Enrich Private Limited. Lifestyle changing careers. If you seek for business, look for insightful. If you seek for politics, 
Look for anticipation. If you live lifestyle, look for the extraordinary. If you love sports, look for the passion. Daily FT. Be empowered. Leading your way to the world of work, we provide a psychometric career test, instantly producing a personalized career report with a matching list of occupations, helping you understand where you should be headed and showcasing the vast opportunities available in the technical and vocational sectors. Interactive tools that help you guide an ocean of career options. Explore jobs based on your skills, the industries you're interested in, or the subjects you like to study. That's not all. Conveniently find out which local university courses you can do based on your A-level stream. And prepare for O-level and A-level MCQ exams with our past paper tool, all freely available. We not only help students, but provide holistic support for career advisors too. For the first time in Sri Lanka, one-of-a-kind integrated portal exclusively for career advisors and officials to manage and track student career guidance progress. Backed by National Careers Database, a comprehensive career-related information hub. Career Me, empowering youth and driving country to success. of the past with the electrifying speeds of Bell 4G. Bell 4G from Lanka Bell. Why wait?